So here we are once again with the screen capture software for another live coding session. And today I'm going to write the last remaining piece for my CPM open source distribution, which is the text editor. Now, I've been having trouble finding a text editor for CPM. It's not like there aren't lots, but they're all either commercial or unlicensed or far too big. But recently I happened to discover this. This is Ant's editor. It's a VI subset written in 31 lines of code for the International Obfuscated Sea Contest. It's intended to be unreadable. Now this is a really, really simple but working text editor. Here is the unobfuscated version and it's still only 360 lines. I can't use this editor. This relies heavily on cursors to do the screen updates and I don't have cursors because I'm on CPM. But nevertheless, the logic it uses to actually do the editing is spectacularly simple, fast and extremely effective. So, with inspiration from this, I am going to attempt to write my own editor. And it is going to be, like Ant Editor, a VI subset, although hopefully a slightly bigger VI subset. So, let us start with some boilerplate. This is going to be written in C. But I'm not using STCC this time, I'm using the Amsterdam compiler kit because it generates 8080 code and is substantially less buggy. So here we have a minimal program. Let us compile this. There we go. And our file is 420 bytes long, which is quite big, but most of that is library overhead. And now I want to run it. So over here, I have CPMish running in a KPro. And uh, I can hear disk noises when I do things. This is using the MESS emulator and MESS emulates floppy disk drive sounds, but I'm not sure if you can due to the way the screen capture works. So in order to actually run the thing, I need to copy the file, I think that's right, into uh, I think this is right. Not quite, this is right. Okay, so that copies the qe.com file into the disk image. So if I do here and do control C, yeah, control C, the kpro control key is in the wrong place. And dir. It hasn't shown up. Oh, great. That means that I'm going to have to restart the emulator every time, which is annoying. So I can't use the emulator to test this because the emulator doesn't have the terminal, uh, it doesn't emulate the terminal emulator that the kpro's got. So there you can see our qe.com, so we can run that when it does nothing, of course. Well, that's irritating. I thought I was going to have the, um, I thought I was going to be able to leave the emulator running and insert the file into the image, but it looks like mess is somehow taking a copy of the image, like loading it into memory. Okay, well, let's just add the qe.com to our disk image then, just to make life easier. And add a program to the build system. There we go. So now I can just do make and it will build qe.com as well as a whole bunch of other things into a disk image. And there it is. Good. 
Okay, back to the program. Now, there are two parts to our editor. The second part, which is actually probably the easiest bit, is the actual editor. That is manipulating the buffer of text in memory. However, the first bit is the trickier one, and this is performing screen updates. CPM terminal emulators are notoriously slow. The K-Pro one is actually pretty quick. Some of the machines I've got have got chronically slow terminals, and you want to keep screen updates to an absolute minimum. Cursors does this by uh, maintaining a copy of what it thinks is on the screen and a copy of what the user wants to be on the screen, and then it computes the minimum necessary change to update the physical screen to the logical screen. And we are going to implement something similar, but smaller. So, the, the K-Pro has an 80 by 24 screen. We're going to be using the K-Pro as the target for this, but it's going to be hopefully portable. And uh, we want a array of bytes for the, uh, the physical screen, actually. Um, We want to use unsigned values wherever possible. So let's just do that for an unsigned char. And we have the logical screen, which is the same. All right. So initialize the screens. We want to actually clear the real screen, which I have over here, the K-Pro, uh, the terminal emulator reference. The K-Pro implements a extended version of the venerable ADM3A terminal, one of the simplest terminals in existence. These are all the sequences it supports. So. Clear the screen is key is control Z, so that is twenty-six. Okay. Oh yeah, another bit of state. We want the cursor position. Um, which I do not need to initialize to zero. Let's try that and see what it does. Luckily, CPM is really quick to boot. Okay, that cleared the screen. How big is it? It is five records, one kilobyte. Okay. Now, we want to define some uh, functions to write to the screen. So, let us put a single character. So, okay. This should be straightforward. Advance the cursor. If we hit the right hand bound, 
move to the left. And increment the Y position. We have no bounds checking. We're going to make sure hmm, yeah, let's just put in a check here. Uh, no, let's put in a check here. We're not going to bother checking the X coordinate, but it's more likely that we'll run off the bottom for the Y coordinate. So put S. So there are no control sequences here. It's you give it a string and it just writes it. Let us do a yeah. If we try to print a, a control code, an unprintable code, then So if the user tries to print a control code, we print instead a humanized version of it. Control codes will not be going through this routine. They'll be going through something else instead. Um, and actually, let's do a... This just does a new line. We also want a, a routine to move the cursor to a particular position. Remember, this is all working on the logical screen. So this is just manipulating a buffer in memory and nothing else. So this won't actually do anything. I must find a way to make mess not display that splash screen. Yep, yeah, of course that does nothing. We weren't expecting it to. And we are bigger. looking for this right now. This is annoying. Okay, so then we want to actually update the physical screen. So what we're going to do to start with is to just iterate through the logical screen and just put each character onto the physical screen. So, uh, 
and we're going to define some more routines to do the ADM 7A control codes. If the user tries to go to zero zero, then we actually have what is this? RS home cursor. What on earth is the value for RS? Thirty. Okay. Otherwise, we actually have to emit the escape sequence to uh, locate the cursor. So that is escape equals y x. So when refreshing the screen, the first thing we want to do is go to that line. And we want to juice a So uh, 40, 20. So it puts more stuff on the screen. Right. Build and run does not build. Okay, that works. You can see the time it takes to do the update. And we actually scroll off the bottom. Uh, so we want to reserve the bottom line for a status bar because uh, drawing on the bottom line is a little bit problematic. So we're going to avoid the issue by not actually putting text there. But this gives you an idea of how slow the text is. And in fact, the K-Pro is pretty quick compared to my other machines. Right. So all this has done is it's just taken the logical, logical screen and it's whacked it onto the physical screen. So now we want to do a bit of update logic. So rather than just do this copy, We're going to find the first change uh, we're going to find the first change So this will scan the screen until it finds something that's different. When we find something that's different, we immediately go there
and then we want to start writing text. So what happens is, we've at this point we've already advanced the physical pointer. So the logical pointer and the physical pointer are pointing at the character after the one we've just noticed doesn't match. So we update the physical screen copy. We write out the uh, the character, and we uh, and then we load the character for next time. So while we haven't reached the end of the line and our text is different. Okay, so this is a pretty brute force system that will, I hope, that did not define string to h, that didn't help. So this is pretty brute force, but it should, I hope, work. Or maybe not. Interesting. So what this is intended to do is it finds strings of changed characters and it just writes those changed characters. So why has that failed? It's also failed slightly oddly. Why has it just dropped the hello bit. So that's E L L O space. That's five characters it's lost. So let me double check that I've got my go to correct. Uh, four characters are required. The first two characters are always esque equals. The next two characters define the column row coordinates using the chart below. And I hope that this is. Yep, that's just simple linear. So it's the oh, that's not. Mm, I've got. I haven't quite got that right. So the coordinates the ADM use are one based. So, but the coordinates my editor is using are zero based. So in fact, I want zero plus. No, I have got that right. Uh, where is? Let's go to. Go -to. Yeah, that's correct. And I've got Y first, which is which is right. Okay, interesting. And we've lost some characters here as well. Uh, 
I'm not a fan of these post mods. So let us refactor this to be a little cleaner. The reason I don't like them is uh, the, the modification only happens if the expression is evaluated. So for example here, pre-pointer is only incremented if the first part of the while is hit. So let's just make this a little bit more This is probably going to do exactly the same thing. Hmm, interesting. I have to say, my gut feeling is this isn't quite right. And in fact, as we're just doing a brute force memory copy, we can do this rather more efficiently. But we're not actually going to be doing a brute force memory copy in the second stage of this. There's some more optimization I want to do. So let's just leave it like this for the time being. But why isn't it working? So what that's going to do is actually do the update in two parts and wait for a key between each one. So that's the first bit. That's the second bit. Why did it print the character that it just read? Does the K-Pro have Echo? I hope not, that would be really awkward. Let's change the text to see if that makes a difference. going on. I know what's causing it. You see, that has skipped the O, O and space. So what it's doing is it's that space here that is causing whatever's happening to happen. So it's printing the first character then it's somehow skipping up to the space and then it starts to emit proper text after that. Right, I can see something that's wrong here, which is that we start scanning, we find a changed character we drop into this code and we start printing text. When we find the, the terminating space that is the same in the logical screen as the physical screen, then we immediately exit the loop. Don't draw that, advance the next one. 
but we're also not advancing x. Yeah, I don't like this code. I'm going to reach. I'm going to change it. I think it needs inversion. Okay, that does seem to be working now. Okay, I do not like this code. We're going to do it, I think, differently. So rather than having two blocks of code, is that actually going to be better? So I was going to use a state variable to decide whether we were drawing or not, so that we uh, combine the two pieces of code into one. But actually, I don't think that will help at all. What we are going to do is change this to a while. So at this point, we actually want to What we have really have here is a state machine. There are two states we can be in. There's reading and drawing, and there's reading and skipping. And they are both fundamentally the same. So I actually do think that using a state variable where is preferable. What I'm a little nervous about is whether having a state variable will actually make things slower. So if we are uh, if we are not drawing And if the characters are different, we need to be drawing. If our state is different, then if we previously weren't drawing, then we need to position the cursor. Otherwise, we don't care where the cursor is. This does involve doing that comparison twice, which I don't really like. And it's a 
it's uh, it is an 8-bit comparison so it's fairly cheap okay well if we're drawing then update the physical screen update the actual screen and advance our pointers. How's this going to look? Okay, that has in fact not done what I wanted at all. That has also not worked at all. That is in fact just redrawing the screen every time. So if the In fact, this wants to be if the character if the character we're looking at needs updating and we weren't previously drawing, then move the cursor. But why is it trying to update the entire screen. That looks better. That does look better. There's still quite an, an irritating delay as it gets from here to here. And I do wonder that's it looking at that that's actually thinking time as it looks at all the characters here. Do I want to do this a different way entirely? So what I was thinking of is that we can actually because these are just um, 
contiguous blocks of memory, then doing a simple comparison is actually straightforward. And then once we've found the character that's different, we can then figure out the pos screen position from that. Uh, let us check this in. And give it a try. So the reason I'm, I'm concerned about this is that we are going to be spending the bulk of our time doing no-op uh, screen updates due to the way the editor works. So we want to make this as fast as humanly possible. So. While the logical screen pointer is not at the end, search for the next difference. So I think even the ATK's terrible code generation will be able to optimize that. Um, no, that's not right. So, if, so this searches for the next change. Then, if the if you reach the end, then we finished our update cycle. Right now, L pointer and P pointer are pointing at the actual position on the screen. So we wish to calculate the screen coordinate of where we are. So that Y is. I'll point to minus screen zero. So this gives us the screen X and Y position. So we go there. Now we wish to start drawing characters until we find a difference. And this will actually wrap correctly. Okay, you can do that.
uh, update the physical screen. No, hang on. If they're the same, stop our update. Otherwise, update the physical screen and move on to the next location. And draw the character. Is that it? Will that be faster? Incompatible pointers, that's because, let's actually do a, that's wrong, we want See what this does. Okay. It's faster. It's a lot faster. Because, but the bulk of the work is happening in this little loop here. Uh, the ACK's code generation is dismal. But then all C compiled to 8080 machine code is going to be dismal. So this is our hot loop. And it may actually be worthwhile um, trying to make this inline assembly. Although now I think about it, let's do this. So the reason why it's so bad is the 8080 has very limited ability to do, to allocate variables off the stack frame, to access variables on the stack frame. So making those two variables static, then we can do global lookups, just simple memory load saves, and that should be faster. That doesn't work. It hasn't worked because Uh, by making these actual globals, then we can use direct memory accesses to get at variables, which is significantly faster and smaller. A bit faster. Is it worth? Okay, I think this is good enough. Because there's, there's another optimization we're going to want to do in a moment. Okay, and... Yeah, that's faster. Good, that'll do. Right. Now, the other optimization you want to do is I will actually like demonstrate uh, 
is that clearing a line is very cheap on the ADM3A because it has a uh, it has a clear to end of wait a minute there's clear screen so I, I looked this up earlier see I thought that was code 17 17 ETB huh okay so I was about to say it has a fast clear to end of line operation so if we can track how long lines are then this means that clearing them is very cheap we can like uh, erase an entire line by putting the cursor at the beginning of the line and clearing the line but I have a suspicion that I've been looking at the KPRO documentation because the KPRO implements a slightly extended version of the ADM3A uh, instruction set but I just want to implement the ADM3A instructions because they are the lowest common denominator and most CPM platforms will implement these in some way Okay, so there's one last thing left to do, which is to put the cursor in the right place. So let's give this a try. And I think our screen refresh is probably done. Whoops. QE. All right, well, it's drawn it and it's put the cursor in the correct position. Okay. Um, in terms of... We also need to make sure that we're getting the height of the screen correct okay right that's what we wanted so our our text editor working space is going to be all of this, but not this line here. This line is going to be our status line. Now, the reason why I don't want to extend the editor to the status line is that drawing to this character here is kind of problematic because if we put a character there, then it may cause the screen to scroll, which we don't want to do. The ADM3A does not contain line insert or deletion operations, though the KPRO does. So we're going to ignore those for the time being. Uh, I also want to test this, because I want to make sure that the wrapping at the end of lines works correctly. So what do we do with this? So we're going to be drawing on the status line in a different way. Um,
do that. Do I need do we need to keep the status line in memory? We don't. We just need to we just need to know the length. Okay. So to draw on the status line, we are actually just going to put the cursor there. Draw the draw the text. Uh, while uh, we then need to make sure that we erase what's left over, so. So then we want to draw spaces until we've erased the old line, assuming that the new line is shorter than the old line. And then we want to put the cursor back where it was. So. So we do that. So wrapping works correctly. Uh, we have a status line here. We have text on the last line and the cursor is placed in the correct position. Good. I am going to call this done. Now we are going to actually start some text editor stuff. Now, the algorithm we're using to store text is a gap buffer. So we define a fixed size buffer. This is going to occupy all the leftover CPM workspace after our application is loaded the text gets loaded at the beginning of this buffer uh, where the insertion point is we then insert a big gap so that the text above the insertion point is aligned to the end of the buffer this gives us a place where we can easily insert new text so in order to do this we need pointer which is going to be the beginning of our buffer, a pointer which is going to be the end of our buffer, a pointer for the beginning of the gap, and a pointer for the end of the gap. Buffer start and buffer end are fixed. They are actually going to be uh, based solely on leftover RAM. Gap start and gap end are the things that will move. So, So what this does is it just CPM RAM and CPM RAM top are defined to be, let me just double check this. Um, 
are defined to be the, yep, here we go, the beginning and end of the leftover buffer. We call brook here to update the uh, um, internal pointers. We don't need to do that, we need to do this. This updates the, the runtime library's internal pointers to stop anything from allocating it. So once we re hit this point, we can no longer do any more memory allocation because our memory is full. Our When our application starts, the text buffer is empty. So the gap, the beginning of the gap is of course the beginning of the buffer. And the end of the gap is, of course, the end of the buffer. But we are actually going to load a file. And oh, I'm just going to use the same. Where did I put it? There we go. We're going to use the same. Uh, CPM command shell source code that we were assembling previously. So this will actually load uh, hang on, I'm doing this wrong, doing this wrong. Okay. New file initializes the initializes the buffer to be an empty file. Load file loads an existing file into the buffer. And in fact, we are going to um, sprintf is huge. Sadly, so this is going to be for test purposes. I'm actually going to remove it later. Uh, it, the printf is in general very big and deadly on small scale systems like this. Uh, CPM provides us a useful general purpose buffer, which is CPM default DMA. So. Okay. Oh yeah, and there's one other thing we want to do, which is we want to call this. What this does is it tells the runtime library to extend our application workspace over the top of the command shell. This gets us an extra 2K of RAM. So let's run this and see how much space we have left. Um, expecting to see something. I think this has done something bad. Sure what? Wonder if if 
Oh, oh, I know what's happened. Right. Uh, yeah, sprintf is evil. I can't use sprintf because it will try to do dynamic memory allocation. Except that just up here, we've like removed our heap. So this is, it's just tried to allocate memory. It's got a null. It's either produced and it's either caught this and produced an error or else it's overwritten CPM workspace. Right, that ain't going to work. So we actually want to do um, I'm trying to remind myself what I2A looks like. I2A is a old and very non-standard um, is an old and very non-standard function for, oh, here it is, for turning integers into text. Because weirdly, the C runtime library does not contain a way to do this other than sprintf, and we can't use sprintf here. So this renders the value into text, then we wish to append some text. And draw it. So I'm particularly interested in this number because this will tell us the biggest file we can load. Bear in mind there is no editor logic here yet. There we go. That is not a number I was expecting. Also my implementation of I2A is not right. That number is also not right. Okay, that's a bit of a pain. What's happened here is that buffer end, we're on a 16 bit system, so buffer end is in fact negative. And buffer start is positive. So, uh, So subtracting a positive number from a negative number produces a negative number. And OK, that's better. 53k is respectable. So we can afford to use up a decent chunk of that for our actual editor logic. Though I still need to, ed I need to fix the I2A logic. It shouldn't be producing leading zeros. I just hacked that in this morning. Okay, right, loading a file. My runtime library contains emulation for file descriptor based stuff. It's not very good emulation, but it does work. So we attempt to open the file. CPM doesn't do byte access for files. You can only read or write complete 1 to 8 byte chunks. This makes its text files a little bit interesting. So not only does it traditionally use CRLF line endings, but there's a special control code that goes at the end of the text file that tells you where the end of the file is. Because uh, otherwise, you know, if you have 10 bytes of text in a file where you only know the size by number of 128 byte records, what are you going to do with the other 118 bytes? So what we're actually going to be doing is uh, reading text into a temporary buffer, and we're going to use CPM default DMA for that. And then we translate the text and read it into our editor buffer. And in fact, uh, 
because we're just going to be inserting it into the gap, that means we get file insertion for free. Okay. Right. Repeatedly, let us read our file. So, keep reading uh, single records one at a time until we reach the end of the file. Once we've re read each record, we now want to iterate through it. Um, let me see. reading one byte at a time hmm. but we want we want to translate CRLF sequences into new line sequences because we want each of our lines in our buffer to be terminated by a single byte so if we get a carriage return at the end of a record we need to know that we are planning on skipping the next one. Okay. If we are skipping otherwise you read a character if the character is an end of file, stop reading right now. If it is a carriage, I'm doing this a complicated way. We don't want to bother with skipping. So we're going to do the line conversion in a really simple fashion, which is that we just drop all carriage return characters, thus leaving only new line characters. If the file contains bare carriage returns, it won't work. That is, the lines will just be merged together. If it turns out this is an issue, we can deal with it later. But bare carriage return files are exceptionally rare. There's only a few systems that use them. The only one I know of, the only two I know of, are early Apple Macs and the BBC Micro. Everything else uses either Unix convention new lines or DOS and CPM convention carriage return line feeds. So if the character is not a carriage return, then write it to the then insert it into the gap. We probably wish to check that we've run out of memory. So we read as much as we can and we stop. Okay. I believe this will load a file. Let's try it and see. Uh, 
At some point in the future, I may uh, not stop using. Uh, yeah, my runtime library doesn't have sysstat. Okay. At some point in the future, I may want to move away from using open and use the raw CPM calls, but there are advantages to using open. Uh, so make, yep. Okay, so we've lost some, we've lost quite a lot of RAM. Is that really 3K? That seems not right. Uh, I bet, oh, right. Uh, yeah, I've just pulled in the file descriptor code, which is quite big. That's why we've lost a couple of K of RAM. Uh, that should be the last big library thing that we uh, will we will need. But this is why I'm wondering about just switching to the raw CPM calls. But we can deal with that later if I want to make it smaller. So this has inserted the text into the gap. We now want to render our text. Now there is there are a few more bits of state we need. We need a pointer to the beginning of the top line that we're going to display on the screen because we render text by starting at the top line and just outputting lines until we hit the bottom of the screen. We need a pointer to the current line, that is the line the cursor is in. We're talking physical, uh, we're talking lines of source text, not lines on the screen. But we also want the uh, I need to think of names for this. We need the position of the current line on the screen. So call that current line Y. Every time we modify the current line, we are going to re-render the entire line. This is why we wanted our screen refresh code to be efficient. So, with an empty file, the first line is obviously the beginning of the buffer. The current line is obviously the first line. And the current line Y position is obviously zero. So, So we now try to render the entire screen. This is in fact going to re-render the entire screen. So the first thing we do is, there's, a, there's one of these helper functions that we forgot to do, which is clear. And that just like wipes the screen. And let's actually put. So when we render the screen, we clear it. Now, starting at the top,
How do we do this? Starting at the top, we're going to draw text onto our logical screen. So while uh, while we haven't run out of screen space, if our input position is the beginning of the gap, skip over to the end of the gap. If our input position is the end of the buffer, then draw an end of file marker and stop. Otherwise, read one character from the from the um, the text. If it is a tab, we also want to track how far in the current line we are. Uh, actually, let's ignore tabs for now. They're, they're easy to implement, but let's just not do it. If it is a new line, this is the end of a line, then move on to the new li next line and reset our X offset. Otherwise, print it. Okay, let's see what this does. Hmm, I have a feeling that failed to load my text file. Yes, it did in fact fail to load the text file because I forgot to put my CCP file into the disk image. So I can do that like this. And there is my CCP. Okay, let's try this now. Try this again. Okay, it's loading the text. And it rendered it. So the tabs have come out as control I's, which is just what we wanted. It filled one tech, one screen full of stuff. Uh, it didn't overwrite the status line. I believe that has done just what I wanted. Good. Okay. Um, we want tabs. The way we do tabs is while we just insert spaces until the X offset uh, is a nice round number. 
we want to insert at least one space, always. And yeah, that should do it. Now there is some other, th a few other things we want to do with this. When we hit a new line, we do also want to check If the input pointer, if we are looking at the current line that the cursor is on, record the Y position of it. Now bear in mind the in P here is before we do any gap adjustment. So if you're looking at an empty line of text, then uh, first line is pointing at gap start, and the character at gap end is the new line terminator. This is what we want so that we can insert text by simply adding it to the beginning of the gap. All right. Now, I don't know how fast render screen is. I suspect not very. So we probably don't want to call it every iteration around the loop. But let's just do that for now for simplicity. So we're actually this beginning our control loop. So we read a we read a character from the keyboard and now we operate on it. Actually, let's just test this first. So we stick a break in so that uh, we can terminate the program. Why oh, doesn't, oh. That should be current line Y. Now I, am, I also need to look to see if mess has a speed up key because I'm going to be spending a lot of time waiting for this thing to load. Okay. So it's expanded tabs, but I'm not sure it's done it right. No, it hasn't done it right. This is what it's supposed to look like. because these are not lining up. Okay. And also the cursor is in the wrong place. It was... It's down here. It should be... Okay, we haven't set the cursor, that's why. Oh yeah, I've forgotten about this. Yep. Uh, we also need... A, 
a pointer to the byte in the line where the cursor is. This is not the same as the screen cursor. This is the editor cursor. And this wants to be here. So if we are looking, if we are actually right now looking at the cursor, then So obviously the cursor must be in the current line. That's a invariant we mustn't violate. Uh, we also want to set the screen cursor. We do th the only way we know where the screen cursor is is by rendering the line and noticing that we are looking at where the editor cursor is. And like this. And after we finished refreshing, we actually want to go to the screen X and screen Y position. Oh yeah, and we're going to look at that tab code. Uh, so, printer space, advanced, ah, that's what's wrong. Right, let's try that. So we load our text. Right, our tabs are lined up and our cursor is in the correct place. Good. It almost looks like a text editor. Okay. Check in. So it is worth remembering that the insertion point, which is where the gap is, is not necessarily the same as the cursor. We can insert text, uh, we can only insert text, uh, modify things at the insertion point. Uh, however, the cursor can go anywhere. So just moving the editor cursor around won't actually modify the uh, insertion point. Now, before I go mad, I'm actually going to do some renaming. So I'm going to change cursor X to screen X throughout. Cursor Y to screen Y throughout. And I'm going to make cursor X and cursor Y new variables that refer to the location of the editor cursor on the screen. So down in render screen, we change this to cursor x, cursor y, delete these two lines. Uh, 
OK. That will make things a little easier to understand. Right, we are now at the point where we want to actually read characters from the keyboard. And I've just remembered why it's echoing the characters. And that's because we're actually going through the CPM con in entry point, which is defined to do this. Uh, sorry, this is the this is the this is the BIOS. So I was thinking in terms of the BIOS. The BIOS con in call just reads a character and returns it. It doesn't print it. But we're using the BDOS entry point. Summary of BDOS functions. We are using this one. Wait for a character, echo it, and return it. What we actually want is raw console input. I am not sure that Yeah, I actually think that there isn't a stock CPM way to do this. And we're actually going to need to call the BIOS. Well, that is annoying. Yeah, I had forgotten that was an issue. And if we're going to be using the BIOS for reading characters, then we probably also want to use it for writing characters. Uh, yeah, we're on CPM 2.2, so we don't support this. Yeah, a lot of these are the the advanced uh, later versions of CPM, which which CPM ish is not, where you can have like multiple consoles and multi user systems and things like that. But we are just working on the very simple CPM two point two because that's the interesting one. Okay. Right, we need to call BIOS functions. That's a little bit trickier than calling BDOS functions because we don't have entry points. So let us create a couple of variables for that. We want con in, con out, and const, const state, console status. And are we going to need to do this as... Um, yeah, we're going to have to write actual machine code for this. Blast. Okay, uh... I'm going to have to modify my libc to do this. I wonder, can... Is there something else I can do? I can connect the reader to the console because I can read from the reader without um, without echoing yeah I can do that I can do that let me just double check the
Mm. So what I am thinking about here is it's possible that CPM defines several input and output devices. We have the console, which is these functions here. We have the lister, which is traditionally the printer. We have the uh, the punch and the reader. These are these were originally intended to be connected to a card punch and a paper tape reader. But these days, what they actually mean, well, I say these days, I mean days after about 1977, what they actually refer to is the serial device or just auxiliary input and output. And it is possible to use a feature called the IO byte, which I can't find, and again, I'm looking at the wrong piece of documentation. A feature called the IO byte to redirect them to something else. I believe I'm getting my BDOS and my uh, I believe I'm getting my BDOS and my BIOS mixed up again. Yeah, okay. There are BDOS calls for the auxiliary input and output. But there is no auxiliary status. Hmm. So the IO byte is a simple 8-bit uh, bit field that maps the logical devices so you've got the list device, punch, reader, and console to physical devices, which is either the terminal, uh, the, the actual screen, a few other things. So we could uh, a TTY is a serial port. Nope, uh, it actually Okay, we can't map punch and reader to the console. I'm going to have to do this the proper way. All right. So we need to take some time off to go edit the uh, to edit the Amsterdam compiler kits. Um, libc because I need to edit my CPM runtime. So here we have the header file containing all the CPM entry points and we're going to need to add a few things for the BIOS entry points. And I'm just going to do const con in con out for now. Oops, that was my screen editor, uh, screen capture. This one. So, so we've got three functions, which is con in, const, and con out. The tricky bit here is that the BIOS has got a rather different calling convention. So where the BDOS, there is a single function you call, and you pass in the, uh, the function number to tell it what you want to do. With the BIOS, there's actually a jump table. And you get at the jump table via a vector in low memory that actually points at this entry here. So what we need to do is to get this pointer, then add a value to it to point at a different table, and then work from there. It's actually not difficult, but it's fiddly.
Uh, so we want to create some This is like unrelated to the editor stuff. So load the address of the, the warm boot vector, which is pointing at this jump here. This is con in, so we then want to add six to it. Xrd comma six, add the two together. CPM, which one are we looking at? This is caught in. We call CPM and it returns the value in A, but we actually want it in HL for because that's the calling convention of our um, uh, of our C compiler. So we now want to call the function pointer to in HL. And there's a standard way to do that. I can remember what it's called. Uh, PCHL. Yeah. Call dot PCHL. Uh, this this calls the function returned to by HL and returns. So it's then move. Okay, move the return value, which is an A, into L, clear H, and we are good. The console status routine is exactly the same, except we call a different routine. Uh, we want to call this one, which is offset plus three. The one that's different is con out. Now, the reason why it's different is the parameter that we actually want to send to the BIOS is on the stack, and there is a standard way to do that. So, because there is no stack frame uh, relative addressing modes, you either have to fetch the stack pointer, add a value to it, and dereference it, or you do this which is we pop the return address of the stack, then we pop the actual parameter. Uh, where do we want the parameter to go? Con out, write the character in C to the screen. So uh, we want it to go in two. Yeah, I just realized I've actually got this quite these two routines quite wrong. Not too badly wrong. The stack frame is in register B and will be corrupted by the call here, so we need to save it. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, Come on out. So that pops up the parameter that we want, the thing that we actually want to write to the console into DE. We then need to get this into BC. However, because we need to put the, the value in C. However, BC contains our stack frame. Uh, also, I forgot the second part of this. So we've popped the two parameters off the stack, but we actually want to keep them on the stack because the routine that called this routine is going to expect it. So each of these instructions is four bytes and they're quite fast. If we wanted to do it the other way, that is via SP, we would need to um, Let me see. So this is the offset into the stack frame we want. There's a routine that, uh, oh yeah, it would be load that in HL, add on the stack frame, uh, then it's, uh, LDAXH, I think, which loads the A register with the value pointed to by the HL register pair. So that's three bytes, one byte, one byte. So it's cheaper to do, just to pop the values off the stack and put them back on again. Okay. So now we want to push our stack frame because we're about to overwrite BC. We move uh, we move the parameter which is in which we put in D E here into C. Now we compute the address of con out, which is our vector plus nine. call PCHL, pop our stack frame back again into B, and we should be ready to go. Right, let's build that. Meanwhile, let's go to our editor. While that builds. We want to replace all calls to CPM conout to BIOS conout. And we want to replace this call to CPM con in to BIOS con in. Okay. Our compiler built, so let's go back to here and let's see if this works. No, it doesn't. Okay, let's see if this works. Well, we've successfully written to the screen, we know that. And it loads our text. Okay, let's press a key. Fantastic, that has worked first time. Good. We're now calling the BIOS to actually do work. Uh, okay, so we have where we were, actually short hydration break. Okay, rehydrated, and I've also figured out the mess speed up key, at least hope I figured out the mess speed up key, which should allow us to like test more quickly. Right. But we've now reached the point where we want to actually start, you know, doing things. So I'm actually going to take the opportunity to put in a few comments. So let's just split things up slightly. Uh, 
Let's just divide things up with a few banners. Insert file doesn't really belong here, so let's push this down a bit. Insert file belongs here. And here we put These are going to be the, this string will contain the sequence of characters that our editor will understand. So the first one we want is L, which is going to simply, like, it's, it's a VI, it moves, the, it moves the cursor. And here we have a array of, um, callbacks that actually do that work. And I cannot remember the C array of function pointer syntax because no one can remember it. So I'll just copy this from here. Uh, yeah, I'm using the exact same logic that Ant's editor used for this because it's, you know, nice and simple. And here is the routine that actually makes it happen. Now, so you notice that as I move the cursor around in this actual vim, you can't put, can't move the cursor right beyond the last character. So the way we do that is we want to look at the yeah that's a little bit odd to be honest I've never really understood why VI never let you put the cursor in the space to the right of the line but anyway, let us replicate this. We wish to move the cursor one space to the right. I mean, the obvious thing to do is just do move the cursor. But remember that the gap's in the way. So if we are looking at the gap, if the cursor is at the beginning of the gap, then we want to look at the cur the character to the right. The cursor nominally goes before the character that we will insert before. So that here we'll be inserting before the parenthesis. So we actually want to look at the character immediately to the right. So if the cursor is looking at the end of the buffer, then there is nowhere to go to so do nothing. If the character to the right of the cursor is a new line, do nothing. Otherwise, move the cursor. And render the screen. Now, this is pretty bad because we've actually just moved the 
cursor to the end of the gap, which we didn't really want to do. And in fact, we don't really care about the about the gap itself. So all we really want to do is fetch the character to the right of the cursor. Now, how did Ant's editor do it? Ah, it, it operates by indices. Also, it does allow wrapping. So moving the cursor to the right here will actually move you to the beginning of the It'll move you on to the new line, actually. You know, operating with indices is actually a much better idea than operating with pointers. Okay, now we're going to stick with pointers. I think that we're going to do things a bit differently. So we wish to move the gap so that the gap is at the cursor. What this means is that uh, we will update the cursor position. We will we will we will move the gap so the gap is immediately to the left of the thing being pointed at. This means that uh, the new gap end will be the thing that used to be pointed to by gap here. That means the cursor will now, after the after the move gap returns, be gap end. So we don't need to worry about this at all. And remember that we can move the gap as much as we like, and it will not actually, you know, change anything semantically. And in fact, we only need to move the gap if the Um, we only need to move the gap if we are going to be looking at... No, no, let's always do that. So, we need to Nope, nope, Ant Editor is right, we're going to use indices. So, uh, given an index, we want to return a pointer to it.
Hmm. I am she's still not not entirely sure I'm doing this right. Using pointers here is actually really advantageous because it allows us to jump directly to the location in memory. But it does require us to update the pointers when we move things around. So it would be safer to use indices here. So that as we move, if we use pointers here, then as we move the gap, we are required to update all these things. If the gap moves from after first line to before first line, then of course the pointer will change. But we also do not want to keep converting from indices to um, pointers and back again a lot. So let's try So this should convert from an index for pointer and back. Now, these are now indices. So these are all go to zero. We wish to detect if we're looking at the cursor. Will that build cleanly? It won't. So yes, if all we do is do if cursor is not pointing at the index of the end of the buffer, advance the cursor and render the screen. It may be as simple as that. So let's actually try running stuff. Now, the way we're going to do things here is we received a character from the user. We look it up in this string using stir in stir cur. Uh, one of the standard string functions index. No, we don't have index. Uh, remember, when in doubt, plagiarize. Uh, it's interesting. Ant editor is in fact not doing. It's not using structure at all. 
down. Okay. So Sturcher looks up a character in a string and returns a pointer to it. If it is a recognized command, then call the callback. Done. And that doesn't work because that is KNR. work better. Missing or illegal qualifiers. Oh. Is that right? No. Cont syntax is kind of bizarre in C. I think that's better. There, that's working. 313 um, compatible pointers in call. because this is a CPM default DMA is an array of bytes, but these functions want chars. Yep, 315. Yeah, same thing here. 327, incompatible pointers. That should be all right. Oh, C is a come on, yep. There we go. Okay, let's see what happens when I actually run it. up key does not seem to be working. Maybe it's not enabled. Okay, now press B, we press L. And it exits. Right, it exits because I forgot to take the break out of here. Okay, right. Yeah, I think I think the speed up key is speeding up execution, but it's not speeding up the disk. Never mind. Right now we press L, and nothing's happening. Brilliant. Well. That could be because my pointer and pause functions here are wrong. So if the pointer is to the left of the gap, then the offset is obviously between the pointer and the beginning of the buffer. If it's after the gap, then, yeah, that looks right.
Well, we need to find out whether it's actually calling my cursor right routine. So this is the easiest way to do that. Um, I'm listening to disk noises. So we press L. Right. Okay, I know what's happening. It's because the caps lock is on and it's registering a uppercase L. So let's try turning caps lock off. Uh, intriguing. Let's check to see whether the caps lock key works. So that's capitals. That doesn't work. Okay, now we are in lowercase. Good. Let us run the program. More loading. L. No. Right, this means that something is wrong with this code down here. Maybe we are returning the wrong value. BIOS con out C. Lots of loading times. Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's why it's not responding to the characters. It's receiving complete garbage. That's a problem with my uh, con in routine here. So con in, wait until the keyboard is ready to provide a character and returns it in A. And I believe I want to put my result in uh, HL. Maybe it goes in DE. I think it goes in DE. Yeah, it goes in DE. Oops. Let's try that. And I'll need to modify const as well. Oh, that didn't go to work. It did not rebuild the editor. That's better. Maybe I will use a smaller text file just to make the testing faster. Okay. Right, we're now receiving, yeah, the long sequences are due to K-Pro key up issues, but we're now actually receiving the correct uh, 
characters. So let's make that a bit shorter. Uh, also, we do need to remember to put a control Z and the file character at the end of the CPM text file. Let's try this. So we load the editor. Now we press L. And we exit. Good. The reason we exited is because I put this CPM exit here. So we're now calling the appropriate routine. Okay, that is actually working. However, there is about a second delay between me pressing the key and it advancing the cursor. This is because it's going through and it's re-rendering re -rendering everything on the screen. And as our text file only goes down to here, that's actually quite bad. So there was a plan the reason why we had first line is so that we can render a single line at a time. So So as we render, we actually want to uh, So I would rather not render one line at a time. Let's try our old trick and just stick some statics in here and here and see what difference this makes. Uh. The reason I'm testing on a K-Pro 2 is it's got like a 2.5 megahertz Z80 and it's like the slowest thing you're likely to find. It's not a lot better to be honest. Yeah, that's terrible. What can we do to speed this up? It's not actually doing a lot of work. The main thing is to just render the line the cursor is on. That's why we had first line in place. This will work fine, but it will mean that moving to the next line will be rather slow. Because we can render within one line quickly
but moving to the next will not be quick. And of course we are doing a full screen refresh. One thing we can do is to hint to the system that we know that only parts of the screen will be made dirty, therefore we don't need to bother actually refreshing other parts of it. That might be worth considering, because we know when we move the cursor that, you know, it's the old cursor position and the new cursor position. Can we improve this? Uh, one thing we can do is we keep here we're doing a couple of complex multiplications in order to uh, locate the position on the screen but we don't actually need to do that every time So this will save a complex multiplication in the hot path, because put C is called a lot. So that should make rendering faster. Mm. Right, screen pointer has not been initialized and it's just scribbled over. Yeah, okay. Screen pointer has not been initialized and it's just scribbled all over the uh, bottom of memory. Our screen is 2K, I believe, and our program starts at starts 256 bytes in, and here we go. And zero page is has got lots of system variables, so that won't work. Okay, let's try. It's not faster. That's disappointing. All right, we're obviously going to have to avoid rendering the screen. Though I'm actually just going to make a slight uh, 
just want to check something. So this is going, to, I just want to see how long a minimal refresh is, because I thought we'd tried that before and it was okay. I just want to double check. Okay, every time I press L, it prints a exclamation mark. Oh yeah, it's uh, so it's calling render screen here. So I'm actually just going to do just stop this out. Put that here. Ah, I think we were calling render screen twice actually. Yes, we were. We were calling render screen twice. So this will actually help a lot by only calling it once. But let's just check this anyway. So every time we press a key, we'll print a queue and do a screen refresh. Well, it's supposed to print a queue. Or yeah, yeah. It can't keep up with my typing. That's too slow. Curses. I really hope I can do this in C. Maybe it's just not fast enough and I'll have to do the, at least the screen refresh code in machine code. I really hope not, because 8080 machine code is kind of grim. We've got a division here, we've got two divisions here, that's not going to be fun. Can we improve things there? Anyway, let's try it like this. I think it is faster, but still very slow. Yeah, I have a nasty, nasty feeling that we may not be able to do this in C this way. So we can, we can hint to the system as to which bits of the screen actually need refreshing. That's this part. But I don't really want to go there. Refreshing the screen is like so core that I want to make it as simple as possible. I just want to refresh everything in one go and rely on the refreshing code to be cheap. We've got some variables here that might be profitably made static.
because trying to do basic work in 8080 machine code is awful. Like 16-bit arithmetic is just grim. Yeah, that's... If we use STCC with its rather better code generation, we may make it work, but I'd rather not. Yeah, that's still too slow. So the other thing is to simply rethink my lifestyle choices entirely. Rather than having the logical and physical uh, screen refresh system, we could just draw directly onto the screen. So we move the cursor, we actually compute that we need to move the screen cursor from this position to this position and just do it. This also means, however, that things like uh, drawing text is just going to be bad. For example, if we want to insert a line, well, if we want to insert a line, we have to redraw everything from the cursor down anyway. So that's not actually a ludicrous idea. So what we would do is our render screen routine here would actually just draw directly onto the screen. It, that, it would mean that drawing a line would replace what was already there. Uh, and we would just have to, you know, brute force text out to the terminal. So that in order to be efficient when doing things like small updates, we would have to be a lot cleverer in our logic. For example, if we insert text into the current line and it doesn't disturb the line following, we would need to notice this and not, like, disturb it. But we only really care about the line the cursor is on and our modifications will consist of when we, when we modify the line we are only going to change the stuff to the right of the current line so we really have three types of update then we have the update where we move the cursor and don't do anything else there's a lot of those and they need to be quick there are the updates where we modify the current line, but no other lines. And remember that lines may wrap. If we insert into the current line, we have no choice but to redraw everything to the right of the line. And the third update is when we modify the current line in such a way that there are cascade changes below the current line. For example, uh, if the line is uh, 80 characters long and we insert another character into it, the line will wrap, which means that we have to redraw everything below that on the screen. There is no other option. With the, this terminal doesn't have any line insert or delete codes. So when moving the cursor,
what we would need to do is to compute the new position on the line and then adjust the screen cursor. Computing the new position on the line basically means running through this rendering logic but without actually drawing anything. The downside is it will mean throwing away nearly all my code, but, well, there is no but. Okay, let us check in. And let's start throwing away my code. Also, I don't like UC star. I think it's ugly. So as we're going to be throwing everything away, let's actually just switch to Though it does actually occur to me to wonder whether the whether I got round to setting the 8080 code generator to do unsigned chars. I can't remember. Okay. Well, screen drawing. Plus side, this will probably make the code a fair bit smaller. Uh, we do want to keep track of where the cursor is, I believe. So Okay, we have no refresh logic anymore. We do still have status line logic. But we're going to do this slightly differently. Because we don't want to upset the... Um, We don't want to upset the actual sp stored cursor position. So Y is going to always be height plus space. This is always going to be zero plus space. Okay, buffer management doesn't change. Render screen will. Now there's
what we want to do, I believe, is that there's two primitives that we want here. One is that we start, we give it a pointer, we give it a pair of pointers, and it will walk from the first pointer to the second pointer and compute the, the length on the screen of that text. And we will use this to determine cursor positions. Uh, cursor positions, actually. Like we move the offset in a line, we want to know where the new cursor is going to be. So we use this to compute uh, the X and Y position. So that's going to be... Uh, we actually, that needs to be used 16, a 16-bit 16 type because our lines can be very long. And this gets um, This is going to need to be quick because we're going to do this in every cursor movement. Our second primitive is going to work very similarly, except that rather than computing the length, it will actually draw the line onto the screen and it will need to return the position of the next line. So, but this will actually draw a complete line. We may want to have it draw fragments, but that's going to be difficult. And we are not, we're going to assume the cursor is positioned correctly beforehand. So this is just going to draw stuff on, draw a line onto the screen until it reaches the end of the line and return a pointer to the next line with the cursor appropriately located. Okay, that's not so difficult. Right. So, as before, as before, we just give up if we if we run off the bottom of the uh, off the bottom of the screen. As before, let's just actually copy all this code because most of this will be unmodified. But we don't care about the cursor position because that's going to be handled with compute length here. And we're actually going to be, oh, we also, we also don't care about this. If we, and we're only doing a single line at a time, so that goes here. Uh, when we receive a new line, then we print a new line to go to the next line. And 
break. We use XO here for tabs. Okay. So our render screen function oh oh uh let's take a look so because we don't have a clear to end of end of line or clear to end of screen command the only way we have to clear lines is to print spaces which means that when we reach the end of line here rather than just printing a new line and terminating we really just we really want to print spaces until we hit the new line that's going to be slow but i don't think we can get away without it So what we're going to do is our, this is going to be the heavyweight render function that's going to render lots of stuff. And we want to tell it where we want to start it from. And it's going to start drawing at the current line and it's just going to keep going down the screen till it reaches the end. So this is actually pretty straightforward. All it is is Draw one line, keep going. Just keep drawing lines till we run out of screen. However, if we reach the end, If we reach the end, then we want to draw both the EOF stop drawing and start clearing to the end of the end of the screen. So So let's have a to EOS. Um, I'm liking this less and less, to be honest.
Yeah, that's actually really simple. So we don't have a con in it anymore, but we do have a con clear. We don't have a render screen anymore, but we do have a render screen that works differently. So con go to zero zero and render screen from first line onwards. Okay. We don't actually have cursor X and cursor Y anymore. Or a current line Y anymore. still exists. Actually, I habitually make all these things uint8, but I have a bit of a feeling, and I will actually check this in a moment, that this doesn't help code size. Uh, the ACK tries very hard to do all arithmetic in words. And I have a feeling that using uint8 everywhere just causes it to do lots of casting between bytes and words. See how this goes. Not quite what I expected. Reasonably sure BIOS con out is right. This has, okay, I know what's happened here. This has completely failed to uh, read the file correctly. So, so you see we have carriage return characters. Here is our end of file. And then we have the garbage that appears uh, after the end of file character and the rest of the record. But why do I have garbage? That 
that's weird. Um, Wait a minute. Where is our end of line character? Test it equal true. Okay, that is that is right. Yeah, we have one A. happened. I know what's happened. Uh, the reason why we're seeing the unprocessed control codes is because this hasn't set up the buffers. It hasn't set up first line correctly. Which means that first line is defaulting to zero. Which means it's reading zero page and what we're seeing yeah, first line zero. These are still these think they are offset. They are offset. This has yes, because it's it's read the buffer that we read the file into which starts at address 0080, which is 128 bytes in. Let's try that. better. So it has drawn our text, it's properly indented, it's then cleared this part of the screen and that bit hasn't worked right. So clear to EOS has actually Do we have a... I think it has written some text to the screen without updating the screen exposition. Where are we? so far. This is status line, so it's expected not to change the... Uh, okay, that actually looks like it's all right. So why has clearing not worked properly?
cursor is in the wrong place. Okay. So we are going to need to set current line and friends from inside. Uh, probably render screen. So because this tells us where we can start drawing when we want to do a partial redraw. I still want to know why that did not clear the screen properly. What I believe it's done here is that it's just printed lines of 80 characters, but starting from here, because that causes the wraparound that's overwriting the status bar. could just be coincidence that something else has gone wrong. Interesting. Don't know why that made a difference. What does con new line do? It just prints a return. No, I don't know why that made a difference. Weird. Okay, anyway, we are drawing... We are rendering the screen, but we also want to position the cursor. We have to have rendered the screen at least once. We want to position the cursor on each line, uh, on each command. So now that we have... Um, Now that we have set our uh, current line and current line Y, we do. So this will tell us the length of the current line. We actually would just want the length from the current line to the cursor position. This then allows us to go to
Okay, now we need to compute the length of the line. And this will involve a simplified version of the draw line code. Because we don't actually need to draw anything, which is nice. So, Don't need to worry about the end of the buffer because we're going to rely on stuff elsewhere not allowing the cursor to be beyond the end of the buffer. We don't need to worry about new lines for the same reason. This will require our cursor write routine to know about new lines. We don't want to move the... If we move the cursor across a new line then we need to update the first line and cursor Y code. That's going to be a little bit interesting, I think. Whenever we hit a tab, we want to round up XO. So but we always want to insert at least one space. If it's a control code, insert two positions. Otherwise, it's one. Well, let's put the cursor in the right place. We do not have any controls yet, so... If we got a command, then call it right. And this just increments the cursor position. So we press L. Nothing happens. Ah. Okay. That's uh, not behaving the way I expected. That'll be my tab code is wrong. So that's supposed to uh that's supposed to round up. I have done that wrong. I think I want that to be nine. Eight, yeah. Yes, so that should round up to the next guaranteed next tab stop. Right, L once. Yep. 
Now put it in the right place. Good. And it can keep up with the repeat key, which is nice. But when we go over the new line, of course, it then goes all skew if. So, uh, cursor right routine. So if if we are not at the end of the buffer and the character to the right of the cursor is not a new line move the cursor. So this should put us to the last quote and no further. Yes, good. Left if the cursor is not at the beginning of the buffer and the character to the left of the cursor is not a new line, move left. Good, that seems to be working. Okay, now the interesting bit is moving down. So what does down do in Vim? Uh, what does down do in Vim? It moves you to the same offset on the line below. So record the offset that we're currently at. Find uh, find the new line. How do I do this? Okay, we know we're not at a new line because left and right above didn't let us. Uh, we might be pointing... Wait a minute, wait a minute. We can't point at the end of the buffer normally no no that's, that's stupid we have to be able to point at the end of the buffer because of empty files so while 
we are not at the end of the buffer, then, uh, and Okay, seek forwards until we see a new line. We are now, at this point, we are now on the new line. After the new line. And then keep cursoring right until we reach the offset. Now, the tricky bit is that we have now moved to a new line. So we both need to update first line, but we also need to update uh, we need to update our current line y because we're on a new line now I don't really want to do it here because I want this to be generic So we actually keep track. How do we do this? So, if the current line we're on has changed, then we need to com compute the new current line y position. And the way we're going to do this is we start at the beginning of the, the top of the page, and we work down until we find the new current line, which may be above or below the old one. So, um, actually, I'm going to out of bound, put this out of line, I think. Because this is this is actually pretty similar to render screen.
So this is actually doing exactly the same logic that render screen above did, but it's not actually going to draw anything. don't know where the next line is, so... Ah, this is actually a bit gruesome. Uh, so we need to, f in order to calculate the length of the line, I need to scan forward to find the end of the line. Uh, compute length here doesn't have a way to return the position of the next line, even though we can actually trivially figure it out by testing for a new line here. Uh, Yeah, yeah, okay. If we hit a new line, stop. If the user provide next P, okay. That should make things a bit more straightforward. So, compute length takes input pointer. End up pointer, which is like the end and where to put the length. And advance that by the correct number of lines. Now this doesn't take into account scrolling, which we're going to have to de tackle next. But let's give this a try. Okay, J. Hmm. Yes, but not yes. And I think it's kind of wedged. Brilliant. Pause buffer start is always zero. Pause buffer end is a constant term, and we could probably factor that out, but I won't worry about that for now. 
So this will always return in P will be the line will be the character after the new line, which is like what we want. And the new line itself has no width, which is what we want. We could also put in an optimization here so that uh, when you're moving the cursor down, we don't start scanning from the top of the page. That will improve the common case a fair bit. Now it occurs to me the other thing we could do is to keep a table of the lengths of the lines on the screen thus avoiding needing the computation at all. Interesting, let's deal with that later. Oh yeah, but there was a thing I was going to do. So current line Y is used in a few places and it's a uint8. So, so let us see how big our binary is 6883 bytes. Six eight six five bytes. Yeah, okay. You went eights are not worth it. But that's gone up. Interesting. Six eight six five six eight five two smaller. Six eight three seven a lot smaller. Sometimes it makes sometimes it makes the code smaller. Uh, sometimes it does not. Mm. Well, the main rule is behind this, behind this sort of thing is pick whatever makes the code clearer, rather than whichever is faster. The main thing I care about is that these all need to be unsigned, because magnitude comparisons from the for signed values are really expensive. Okay, anyway, let's try, let's take a look at this screen position stuff. I am going to, for debug purposes, uh, steal uh, I'm not going to steal, I'm actually going to write 
my own, to be honest. Um, I need some debug routines. And at some point we're going to want to print. This is actually... Uh, we are going to want to print numbers. Okay, we press J. That's interesting. It did not call recompute screen position at all. Let me just double check my HJ cursor down. Uh, Uh, I don't want to change first line, I want to change current line, uh, that's why, okay. So many edge cases, so, so many edge cases. All right, down. All right, it got the length of one line and then terminated. So I think that may have done the right thing. I believe I mentioned before, I'm testing on this K-Pro2 because it's the slowest and creakiest emulator I can find. So if my editor works on this, it'll probably work on other things. Down. I th think that's correct. I'm a little unconvinced by the delays, but let's take out our test code and try it for reals. This is not even slightly right. Intriguing. Uh, that's because this needs a plus one on it. Because if the length is... Does it need a plus one or do I want to round up? I think I want to round up because an 80 line long, an 80 character long line does an 80 character long line occupy one or two lines of screen? I think two. So we do that. Down. Ah. Uh, 
And this needs to be current line Y. And this is just wrong. Yes, if we arrive at the line we're currently on, just stop now. Okay, down. Ooh, it went down. I don't know why it's moving to the end of the line. Can we move left? Yeah. So we do have cursor movement. What? If we go down from here, nothing should happen. No, it, uh, in fact, goes horribly wrong. Yeah, um... Cursor down, which is here, should actually check if it's at the end of the buffer. Well, ideally it shouldn't do anything, but given that we've already moved the cursor... If we find we're at the end of the buffer, then just stop. No, that's not going to help, because cursor right knows it's at the end of the buffer and will refuse to advance. So we're actually on the beginning of the next line, or the end of the buffer. I think that what we want here... If we hit the end of the buffer, just stop. So now the cursor is pointing at the end of the buffer, and yeah, that should be fine. Right, cursor downing is actually not the fastest. So I think we're going to need to use our table of line lengths. Oh well, that shouldn't be too difficult. Let me just add cursor up. This actually explains some of the oddities. Now, if we are at uh, if we are at the end of the line, there, if we're at the end of the buffer, then of course we can't look at the next character. So yeah, we are going to have to do this test.
so while the cursor is not at the beginning of the buffer and we are So Ooh, interesting. Keep going backwards until we are looking at a new line. until we're looking at the character before the new line. No. Okay. Move to the beginning of the current line. Now, so pre decrement, so keep going backwards until we see a new line that is beginning of the line before. So if the document is empty, then current line uh, buffer start and buffer end will all be the same. So Hopefully this should allow us to navigate around our document on a single page. Down. Looks promising. Up. Not promising. Can we move? No, that seems to have wedged. Let's see if we can move a bit more easily. Let's see if we can move left and right. So down, right. I hope that works. Down, okay. Let's see if the offsetting works. Looks good. Up. Has not worked at all. That's in fact just moving left one, which is not right at all. So this produces the offset. Skip back to the beginning of the current line. That's the character after the new line. Keep working left. 
this is after the new line so give up over at the beginning of the buffer back up so that we're looking at the new line Keep backing up until we hit the new line previously. I am not keen on any of this logic. I wonder whether it might be worth allowing the cursor to be on new lines. So down. Yeah, it hasn't worked. Yeah. Because that would probably simplify a lot of the edge cases. It also means that we can just keep going left and right. I mean, it won't be standard, but it's not. this isn't going to be standard anyway. It does mean that we will need to be aware when we cross line boundaries. Okay, I need to take a break. I will think about that and come back again. All right. Dinner has been had. I have thought about what I'm doing here. I think I need to simplify considerably. So Ant's editor, which I was basing this on, uh, has the gap buffer, and then it has the cursor position, and the cursor position is not necessarily at the gap. And I think that this is making things too complicated. It's leading to complicated logic like this, which is slow, because you know this is an 8080 at two and a half megahertz. It's it's you have no idea how slow this machine is, but more importantly, it's leading to more complex invariants that I am not able to correctly maintain. So what I'm going to do instead is decree that the cursor is always at the gap. So this means that we no longer need a separate cursor position. It also means that first line is by definition above the gap. That is, uh, let me think of directions, towards the beginning of the document. That can actually just be a pointer because we know that this will always be true. Likewise, current line is always like that. So this should make a lot of things simpler. So this means that as we move like character by character through the document, we have to move bytes from one side of the gap to the other. I also believe that we need to keep track of the lengths of the lines on the screen so that we can efficiently move from one to the next. Uh, in particular, we need to be able to get the Y position of the line above the one we're currently at. Uh, however, I could be wrong about that because we may be able to do compute length here is pretty cheap. So it may be possible to just work backwards from the current line, find out the previous line, compute the length of that, and then use that to adjust the Y position. So I'm going to give it a try without. Anyway, we no longer have pointer or pause. We no longer have cursor. 
these are all pointers. Old current line, I don't know whether we'll actually need. Let's try and make this work without it. So, compute length. We give it a start pointer and an end pointer. Now, this one will remain untouched because we may need to, we probably want to compute the length of a line that spans the gap. Like, the line that the cursor is currently in will span the gap, so we leave that untouched. Likewise, a draw line does the same thing. Render screen is going to change because render screen is going to start at a offset. It's going to start at a position which will be above the gap. So this will be above the cursor or at the cursor. So we start from the current Y position and we keep rendering down. If we find ourselves in the current line, then we know what the current line Y position is. We draw the line, we keep going until we hit the end of the buffer. Recompute screen position. Now this will start at the first line. And it will work down rendering lines until we hit the current line. So this, this will recompute current line Y based on first line and the, yep, okay. So these will change because we now have no cursor. So cursor left, the uh, if If we are not at the beginning of the buffer and the character to the left of the gap where the cursor is, is not a new line, then Move one character from the start to the end. Now, these pointers all point at the beginning of the block in question, so uh, it's a pre decrement in both cases. If we are not at the end of the buffer and Do it like this for consistency. And the character to the right of the cursor is not a new line. Then move a character from the end of the gap to the start. Now this is not right because the cursor is not allowed to be uh, on a new line, which this represents. So in fact, the new line we want to look for is there. We do not want to allow the cursor to move any further in this situation. The 
the only situation where the cursor will actually be pointing at where the gap where the character after the gap will be a new line is when we are appending to an existing line which happens as a separate mode that we haven't implemented yet so uh, to So that is more correct. We want to ensure that there are at least uh, two. Mm. So if the if we're on the last line of the document and there is no trailing new line, then this will prevent us from um, approaching the end. Also, that is wrong. We'll leave it like that for the time being. Okay, cursor down. We wish to keep moving characters from one side of the gap to the other. That is, we want to pan down the document until we reach a new line. So, While there are still characters to the right of the cursor, and the character to the right of the cursor is a new line, then So the character to the right of the gap is either the end of the buffer or a new line. We wish to treat the end of the buffer as if it's a new line. Uh, however, would it be easier to make sure that the end of the buffer is always a new line? I think it would be. So that we guarantee the buffer always terminates in a in a new line. Yeah, let us do that. So, if the last character, uh, no, no, hang on, I don't need to do this at all. If we have read some data and the last character in the buffer is not a new line, then write out a new line.
Okay, so this means that we cannot cursor right past the This ensures we want to have the last byte in the buffer being the new line. Yes. So the gap cannot advance past that. This means that buffer end is dereferenceable. This will make life a lot simpler because now I can say Now that is valid, because if this condition is true, then gap end must be less than buffer end, which means that gap end 0 is dereferenceable and gap end 1 is either part of the main buffer or it's our terminating new line. Uh, we also get to use a not equals rather than a, ma uh, a magnitude operator because those are gruesome. So for now with this, we keep moving until the character at the end of, immediately after the end of the buffer is a new line. If we have in fact hit the end of the buffer, then we really want to back up one. But in a zero length line, we still have to cope with zero length lines. I'm trying to maintain the, the, the normal VI behavior where you can't put the cursor on the new line after a carry after a line. But on a empty line, that's going to be true. Now, stuff that. I'm just going to do it to see. I'm going to allow the cursor to be on a new line. So, keep going right until we hit a new line. Keep going right until we hit a new line. If we have hit the end of the buffer, give up right now. Otherwise, move one more character so that we're now looking at the beginning of the next line. Set the current line. and then keep going right until we run out of offset. Likewise, when we go back again, when we go backwards,
keep going left until we uh, keep going left until we hit the new line. No, sorry, I'm missing a step. Um, rewind back to the beginning of the current line. So we are now looking at the first character of the line. So gap start minus one is the new line. If we hit the beginning of the buffer, give up. Keep going backwards until or keep going backwards while we have not reached the beginning of the end of the buffer and So we're now looking at the, the character immediately after the new line for the previous line. So and then we move right until we reach the offset. Okay. Now, location position. We want to compute the length of the current line, because that is now a pointer. Cursor has gone away, that is now gap start. And yes, we do want old current line. No, that does not need to be uh, above the... Um, it does not need to be above the gap because if we are actually moving up, then the current line will be bogus. We just need to know it, it's changed. So this will cause it to recompute the screen position on the first pass through. Though I think render screen will do it for us. Yes, render screen will do it for us. Okay. See what this does. So we load. It rendered. Um, yeah, it in fact rendered wrong. So because the gap now represents our cursor. Because we've loaded the file to the beginning of the buffer, the gap is after the buffer, so the cursor is actually here. So, we 
we do kind of want to move uh, to the very beginning of the file. Uh, what is the... So the the sequences I know to go to the beginning and end of the document are G and 1G, but I am pretty sure there are standard sequences to go to the top and bottom that don't involve that. Do I want a jump motion? No. I want a, an up down motion. So shift G is go to line, control end or G, uh, G, G, no, right, I'm just going to use G, so I will implement the rest of go to line later. But for now, what it's going to do is just go to the top of the document. I think that's all we need for that. So we try it out. And it still hasn't worked. Intriguing. I will put some uh, let's say let's have some debugging. This is the sort of thing you want printf for. So what that will do is it will display on the status line the position of the gap or rather the size of the the buffer b before and after the gap. Yeah. So there is nothing before the gap and 332 bytes after.
Ooh, I can go right. That's actually doing the right thing. You can see as I move right, lines are moving, uh, bytes are moving from the, uh, the bytes are moving across the gap. So we should reach the end of the line and then it will stop. I think it hasn't placed the cursor correctly. Yeah, there we go. So it does seem to be working, it just hasn't placed the cursor. So compute length is booked. start we want to do that because we're passing in gap start as the end point yeah so what it was actually doing was it was counting the length of the line but not stopping at the cursor, which is why the cursor was stuck at the end of the line. Ah, keep doing that. Okay. So we are moving right. It's quite slow because, partly because it's drawing this. Let's try going down. Yeah? Up. Yeah? Let's see, if does it maintain the offset? Yes, that's okay. Good. Let's take this off and see what that does to our performance. You can keep up with the repeat key. Good. Down. Up. Looks good so far. Okay. Let's put some more text in our document. Let's put a line here. We also want to insert some garbage so that it spans a couple of pages of uh, so it's longer than one screen full of text. see what this does. Right. 
So what this has done is it's hit the end of the line that's wrapped and then it's printed the new line to uh, move to the next line. We don't need to do that because we wrapped. So where is put C? Yep. We do not want to call new line at this point. All we need to do is that. Also has the advantage of being faster. Much better. So we go down. Yep, and we are correctly spanning the multiple line. Uh, it's slower. Ah, calculating the length of this is a lot slower. So up here it's quick, down here it's not. So that's okay. Moving back and forward here is all right. So can we, uh, actually let's just commit that, shall we? So that'll be compute length here being slow. Uh, we could make these things static. Or we could uh, try and remember the length of the lines. The variables that are going to change most are like in p and end p, which are not easily made static. Xo as well. better. So if the we can always work forwards. So 
I could put some logic in here that we detect whether we're moving down the line and we start from the current line which we have a pointer to. Or we can record the lengths of the lines and I think that is what I would rather do. So render screen, let's render screen gone, render screen here, uh, starts at the beginning of the screen, well it starts from here, because we're going to use this to um, Yes. So what we want to do is No, that is going to that is going to store the the byte length of the line, which is not what I wanted. What I want is put this back the way it was. It's draw line here that's going to have to update the pointer. So this is going to be the y position that we started drawing the line. When we finish drawing the line, we record how long it was. Render screen here wipes the uh, the line length buffer from the point where you start drawing down. So recompute screen position here only work will only work if you are if you've previously called render. So if uh, right. Fetch the cached length of the line that starts at that position on the screen. If there is no length, then actually compute it. So that didn't work. Uh, 
Ah, this is not going to work because this is going to update in P to point at the next uh, line. Uh, this will this will point at the data for the next line. But line length stores the uh, the character length, which is not this. The, the, the on-screen length, which is not the same. Do we have to cache those as well? Let's rename those and let's... And this is going to be the byte length. Uh, status display. I renamed this by mistake. Status line length. Okay. So this will now contain the um, that should now contain the uh, the byte length of the lines on the screen. Now what this is all in aid of is moving rapidly around the screen. If you need to page, we're going to have to re-render and recompute these tables. But we're expecting that. I have thought of other representations of the data. So rather than having a new line, ah, oh, this doesn't work. Rather than separating lines with a new line, we can use uh, length and data. This will allow us to page very rapidly through the data a line at a time. But I think that if you're looking at a long document, it won't be rapid enough. And also that will only let us look forwards. Looking backwards is a lot harder because we won't be able to find the beginning of a line unless we know where the beginning of a line previously is. Wait a minute. We don't care how long the line is in characters. We only care where it what what y position it starts at.
because we're also going to use the same information to decide whether we need to re-render the lines below the one we're currently at. So in fact, what we want to store is we want to go from a position in memory to the Y length. Is that true? Well, this is flipping us to the bottom of the document, the bottom of the page. Because in P here is not actually lining up properly. So it's never actually equal to current line, therefore we never stop. We just keep going round until the, this loop here throws us out. So this suggests that current line But start P is the pointer of, of the beginning of the line we want to draw, and in P is the pointer at the end. So this should be right. That should be like the correct length. This should annotate the screen with the contents of the line length cache. Okay. looks okay except for this one which is 115 that is not 115 characters long because it's spanning the gap right yeah um. This is vile. So we artificially adjust the start pointer here so that the line length here will come out correct. I keep forgetting you have to press a space bar to get past the stupid splash screen. I wish I knew of a way to turn that off. Okay, down. Oh, we're actually in the right place. Fantastic. Yeah, you can see how slowly this is drawing. Is this going to work? Yes, it is. Great. So, let's... Is that uh, 
Ah, space bar. Okay, down. Yep, that's nice and snappy. And we can move back and forwards. Good, that looks like it's working. So, next thing to do is... We've done some basic motion, let's actually try inserting text so this is going to involve re-rendering the current line we know the cursor is in the right place We will, in fact, uh, just do this. Pressed escape, leave insert mode. User has pressed delete, so backspace. only backspace if like we can and we want to copy a uh, we actually just want to rewind over the character we last typed otherwise insert the character after processing the user input we do need to re-render the current line which we do with draw line Go to uh, current line Y, draw line, current line, and this will return the beginning of the next line. This will update the line cache. So we want to remember how long that was in lines. If
it's changed. Then re render the document. Starting with the next line, and we know the cursor is already there because draw line left us there. Okay, let's go to back here. Press I, insert mode. Hmm, that's actually working. Let's see what happens when we wrap. It's look, the tab stops are working and everything. Okay, it's a little bit slow. Yeah, that's not keeping up with my typing anymore. But you know, that ain't bad. That is not bad at all. Let me see if escape works. Well, we haven't updated the Okay, yeah. We, we're not updating the status bar, which is why it didn't go back to... Uh, which is why the status bar didn't change when we exited. Okay, let's try typing some more. Press the delete key. Yep. Now, I probably shouldn't let you delete there. It's not really VI-ish, but... Ha, huh, yeah, okay. Uh, because it's ignoring, it's not allowing you to delete at the beginning of the line, it ends up inserting the control code instead. So it does that, which is a bit weird. That is not bad at all. But we do need to put the cursor in the right place, which involves... This So we actually want to do if C is um, else if C is eight. Okay. Let's give that a try and see if it works. Okay, the cursor is actually in the right place. We're not doing the traditional VI thing where we move the cursor back one after leaving insert mode.
but that is deliberate. Okay, now that's acting a bit weirdly, but, but it's correct. It's actually maintaining the offset when moving up from this two-line line to this three-line line. But as this one contains tabs, it's a little bit weird. Because a tab is logically a single character. Okay. I kind of want to put something in the status bar to like tell you where you are, but I don't think that's a good idea because it would involve moving the cursor, which would be expensive. Uh, let us try. have some more movement keys. We want one of them. That just takes us to the beginning of the line. So this one should be easy. this we can simply okay check this works Move right, home, there you go. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that to go wrong. Uh, end. This is definitely going to be VI-ish, not VI. Yep, keep scanning forwards until we see the new line. This is another home. That's right. Cursor up. We home to the beginning of the current line. We step back one. We home again to get to the beginning of the previous line. And then we step forwards until we hit the position we want. Okay, well, end of line. Beginning of line. That works fine. Does up still work? No, I balked it. In fact, it's hung. I know it hasn't, it's just really confused. Um. Okay, that condition is different, that's why it's.
down, up, end of line, beginning of line, end of line, beginning of line. Awesome. Okay, there's a few more important ones. W is word forward, and B is word back. Now these ones wrap. On a slow system, they're absolutely vital. So, word right. Now, how do we define a word? Well, I believe that Vim does it by a boundary between a space and a non-space. So what we want to do is we just want to keep going right. Until. The previous character is a space. And the next character is not a space. So let's try it. W. Uh, get that right. The previous character is a space and the next character is not a space. So why is it stopped there? Ah, right, okay. In fact, it's more sophisticated than that. It doesn't use spaces, it uses, it looks like alnums. I don't like alnums because, <clears throat> I don't like is alnum because it's, this libc uses a lookup table and it's a bit expensive. So still, our editor is currently 7.5k, which isn't bad. So... What we actually want is an alnum on the left. So if the thing on the left, we want we continue looping, if the thing on the left is not an alnum, or the thing on the right is an alnum. So for this condition to be False. Yeah, I think that's better. Okay, W. Eh? That's not quite what I wanted. He's gone to a th place. It won't go any further. Oh yeah, we need we need to bump it. Okay, so it's moving to the end of words successfully. Ooh. 
Wait, why is that going there? That's not a word. No, it is using spaces. Or not. Motions. A word consists of a sequence of letters, digit underscores, or a sequence of other non blank characters. A capital word consists of a sequence of non blank characters with white space. Okay, we want this to be simple, so... Complicated than I thought it was. want to do it we want to move at least one space so we do this because that guarantees us that left is that lets us read left at the same time so right is gap end okay so if left is alphanumeric and right is not alphanumeric this is a word that will put us No, we want this the other way around. Because you want to be on the beginning of words. Let's try that. So this is a little bit messy. It's not line wrapping. Uh, yep. Um, if left is a space and the right is not a space then stop now how do we handle new lines if we pass a new line then we need to update current line
So we can look to see if left is a new line, but that doesn't tell us that it's... Uh, yeah, if left is a new line, then this means that right is not a new line. Yep. If left equals a new line, the current line equals... Let's try that. That works fine. And that lets us skip relatively quickly. It's keeping up with the repeat key, which is which is good enough. Good, that works. Right, word left. Uh, that would be the B character. Yeah, I still don't really understand why that makes such a difference to the code size. Okay, if start is not equal to buffer start, because we're moving backwards. Actually, now we've refactored this. Characters to the right, so we want gap start equals gap end t left equals gap start times one if. This is more complex because uh, when we pass the new line, we're not looking at the beginning of the line, we're looking at the end of the line. So if right is a new line, then we just indicate that we need to recompute the line start and if then we wish to And then we wish to wind the current line back to the beginning of the current line. 
So we want the character to the left of current line to be new line. So So word forward, word backwards, wrap, yep that works fine, good, good, we are making progress, it's actually mostly, the basic editor is mostly there, uh, and yeah this is a previous editor I looked at. It's a pretty decent, simple editor, but um, it's all written in KNRC and I had a lot of trouble making it compile. Well, in fact, I couldn't make it compile. And I also suspected it was going to be rather big, so hence the current project. Okay, now it's a VI, so there is one feature we very much need, which is the command count. Um, going to do it like that. is a digit then uh, update the command count and Do I want to attempt to uh, do I want to actually attempt to show this on the status line? Let's let's have a go and see if it's fast enough. Before identify okay. Uh, 
Okay, so let's try one, two, three. I think that's fast enough. Yeah, <laughs> spot the UN16. Um, because you're not actually. It's going to be about half the number of characters in real life once I've fixed I2A. And you're mostly only going to be doing one or two things. So I think that's good enough. Um, this will wipe the status line afterwards. Okay, we now actually need to pass the count into the function so they can do, you know, the right thing. I define that as an unsigned. Uh, it should probably be a uint 16, but never mind. Uh, yeah, I will make it a uint 16. I mean, an unsigned is a UN16 with this uh, architecture. So home is easy because count is ignored. End is easy because count is ignored. Left. Now we actually if the command count needs to default to one, and these just turn into simple loops. It's when we start getting to stuff like go to line that life begins to get a bit interesting, which, by the way, I should actually implement. Yeah, the 8080 is like the worst language for doing this kind of, uh, the worst architecture for doing this kind of thing in, due to having like lousy pointer support. You can just about do loops like, uh, where's my, uh, you can just about do loops like this, uh, using two of the register pairs, but it's it's just really painful and the compiler can't manage it. Okay, now inserting text VI does actually support this. I can say t like in uh, 10 insert foo escape and you get 10 of them. But it's quite hard because you end up with two different implementations of the code. You've got the one where you're reading the user's input, 
and then you have the second one where you duplicate what just got written. I think that's doable actually. So here's the first one. And here will be the second one. Now we wish to record uh, no, this is actually harder than it looks. If we're just inserting stuff it's one thing but if the user's deleted stuff that's why we don't normally let you delete left. What does v, what does vim do for this? Uh, three insert. It resets the count. Uh, let me try that. Five insert backspace. Said, said. No, that actually. Interesting. Okay, well, we'll give it a go. Um, incidentally, I've spotted a problem with this code, which is if you type in a new line, then it doesn't work. So we wish to record where the where we started. That's going to be gap start. I think that if we're backing up uh If, if we ever er, delete beyond the beginning of the, the point where we insert, then you know just give up doing any repeated insertions. Now, when the user pressed escape, the text they just typed in spans the memory from start p to gap start. So we can actually just duplicate that uh, Yes, we can do this. So I was just going to do some mem copies actually, but um, we do want to check for, actually we do need to check here, this is the first point where we're inserting text, we need to check for end of, uh, out of memory conditions. So if, yeah, okay. If there is enough space for all the repetitions, then
destination is gap start, source is dart p, size is len, we know they don't overlap, therefore mem copy is safe. Gap start plus equals len. Okay. Uh, and we can actually put go to line in now, though it says it's not actually implemented. So right offset. Three for one is and incompatible pointers. So let's try going right five. Yep. Good. Ten down. Eight up. Good. Let's try ten. Insert. Foo. Escape. It did oh, we've got to re render. Which reminds me that there's actually a very important uh, command I need to implement. Uh, so I believe this. The escape is octal, isn't it? So we want control L. 12, 14, yeah. Because things always go wrong and it's really useful to have a uh, a very simple command that just makes it re-render everything on the screen. And we do that by calling render screen first line. So we've had, this is going to be the third point where we're going to use this code. So this three lines of code here. So we're actually. We also want to do this. Okay, well, for a start, we want to put this in as a common piece of code. Actually, do we want to put this here? Yeah, I think we do. So in fact, so this will actually do a little bit more work each key press. So we need to be really careful about performance. So 
So if we do repeated inserts, then there's a pretty good chance that we are going to be um, changing the length of the line. And yeah, we are going to have to come up with a way to do new lines here. You know what? New lines are more important. Let's lose this piece of code. We can always put it back again. Let's make sure this all works. Okay, control L. Hmm, didn't do anything. Apart from, you know, locking up. I don't need to go to the beginning because that will do it. Damn it, that should work. Uh, Control L is hex 14. No, uh, octal 14. Yeah, L. Um, I had actually pressed the caps lock key rather than the control key because the K Pro control key, at least in this emulator, is in the wrong place. Right. Control L. Yep. Good. Right. What happens if we actually type in some new lines? Return. Oh, of course it does. I should have expected that. You spot the cursor doing the right things, it moves across the, the control code. So. So we are inserting a new line. This is going to definitely change the height of the current line. So we are going to need to re-render it from the current line. So if we have space, Insert the new line. Go to the current line. Draw it. The next line will, of course, be junk. But uh, actually, draw line will return a pointer to the next line. So, in fact, if we do current line equals draw line, that will update current line for us to the beginning of the next line. We then flush. the display length of that line. Uh, 
the new line is drawn one below was drawn below this one So we'll then fall out through here, and this will attempt to render the line again. Uh, we've moved on to the next line, so this will attempt to render the next line, and uh, which will then cause the rest of the screen to be refreshed. So let's give that a try. Now this is all. G so the thing we're going to have to do after this one is the really important bit, which is scrolling, and I think that's going to be a bit of a nightmare. So, insert, foo, return. It wasn't what I wanted. Uh, and why is the cursor down there? Because it didn't split the line properly, that's why. We don't want to return. We don't want to insert the carriage return. We want to insert the new line because that triggers the. That's the code we use internally for the new line. Let's try this. wasn't really what I wanted. Was it? Yeah, that hasn't rendered the rest of the line. The rest, the, the insertion bit's working. You know, we actually have to render everything anyway, so let's just do render screen. We're in the right place, so we just do render screen current line. It just draws the rest of the screen. Uh, we are then going to drop through here and... Uh, We are going to drop through here and it's going to render it again, but let's just see if that works. Yes, that is working. Why doesn't it re-render? Oh yes, while we're at it, display length can turn into display height. So that will save a number of divisions. This is going to contain the number of lines only which can of course never be zero.
it hasn't chopped that much off. We were up to 8k, and the scrolling will probably add a chunk. Then we need to do file saving, which is probably not that much work. Um, we're about to hit, for the, for the K-Pro, we're about to hit the 50k mark for text files. So I'm a, be nice to add stuff like search, but we're not going to get uh, regular expressions. It's just not a chance. It'd be nice to have stuff like change, change word. We certainly need a few delete operations. We need at least DD, and we definitely need X. But I think we can probably call it done at that point, at least to begin with. But we do need to make this work and make scrolling work. That draws the current line. We're in the right place. So we should just fall through the rest of this code. Insert, foo, return. Okay, that is working. I wonder what's different from last time. Okay, never mind. Okay, and we're just going to ignore the count. I think this is going to get way too complicated. At least until we get scrolling. Okay, I need another rehydration break. Uh, 570 lines, that's not bad. I need another rehydration break, and then let's have a go at scrolling. Okay, um, actually, before I do scrolling, let's just add append because it's easy. In a real VI, it, impending text involves moving to the special place to the right hand side of a line that you can't get at, but for us it's easy. All we do is like so. Let's make sure that works. And then we think about scrolling. So we control the scroll position by the by first line, which tells the system the address of the top line on the screen. So append. Okay, that didn't update the screen position. Never mind. That's easily done. So, in order to scroll, what we need to do is to nominate a new line to go at the top or the bottom. The tricky part is that we have to have the start of a line at the top of the screen. Append. So 
So when we reach the bottom of the screen, and we want to go one more down, we need to f probably figure out a line roughly in the middle of the screen. Nominate that as the, the top of the screen, and then redraw. So everything will then shift up half a page. That's reasonably straightforward, because you can start here and go down. In the other direction, it's tougher, because uh, once we have scrolled to this point, and you scroll up, we need to work backwards, which we're not very good at doing, until we have counted a certain number of lines. And we need to trigger this when we go off the bottom of the screen, or off the top of the screen. Again, going off the top of the screen is easy, because we know that if a current line is less than first line, we're obviously off the top of the screen. But going off the bottom of the screen is harder because this line at the bottom of the screen may actually be quite long. So, if we go off the end, then, yeah, you can see it's got confused and we're now drawing into the status bar. Let's insert some. What happens when you reach the end of this? Also, we should come up with a way to avoid redrawing most of the line in this situation. Oh, it wraps around to the top. That's interesting. So that's just the terminal being weird. Okay, now it's got very weird. And I think it's hung. So, how do we do this? I think that for the for testing scrolling, when we hit the bottom of the screen, if the line... Actually, let's see what VI does. This is Vim, rather. So let's make a big line. Big line. So VI insists that the top of the screen is a line. Uh, you can't actually scroll down any further. It just snaps to line 512. So uh, off the bottom of the screen. Ah, uh, it's interesting. It won't even render it. That's a good idea. That just avoids the issue completely of what happens when the cursor's there. Yeah, we and we can... Uh, we don't actually have that information. So... We calculate the line lengths as we draw, so... By the time we realize that the line is off the bottom of the screen, then it's too late. But we can stop the user putting the cursor there. That's straightforward. We just check to see if you know the current uh, the current current line y plus the height of the current line is greater than or equal to the height of the screen. So, we need to test for a case when we need to scroll. And do the right thing. So, if the current line is less than the first line, Else, if current line y is greater than or equal to height, 
because we know this means that the, the users just put the cursor down uh, off the bottom of the screen or current line y plus Um, display height current line y uh, display height is only valid after we've drawn the screen okay let's go with that for now if that is Okay, now in this, so after any command, we obviously need to test to see whether the cursor's moved. We're also going to need to put it into insert text. Obviously, we'll only be able to test the scroll off the bottom at the moment. Hmm. Uh, off by one error. Dusk. Oh, yes, uh, cursor down. Ah, right, okay, okay. Uh, we actually need to do this from inside recompute screen position because that's the thing that then that updates um, cursor Y and moves the screen. So, yep, that's actually reasonable. Plus, we ought to get testing for scrolling for free in a number of places. So, In fact, we don't want a separate function to do this at all. We actually want to do it right here. So, if current line is less than first line, uh, scroll down. If is then this if here
So it is important to note that this will invalidate first line because that will, that may change, and it will also invalidate the all the various display caches. Down. Okay, we need to scroll up. Good. So scrolling up. We need well firstly we need a new line. Uh, it also occurs to me that scroll down here is then going to fall, fall through into this code which is going to recompute the screen position but we're actually going to want to call render. Render does not set the screen position, but it does update the caches. So that's actually fine. Scroll down, we'll adjust the pointers, and it will re-render the screen. And then we go through this code, and it will then compute the position to place the cursor. This code has to happen after we've done this, and if we need to scroll, then of course we have to do this bit again. So this is actually going to need to be a loop. loops like this. It's the trying to put the conditional in the middle. Okay. Anyway. So scrolling up So, I think we actually want a re a, a single function here. Because what we want to do is to figure out We want to try and put the current line, the one that's been pointed to here by current line, kind of in the middle of the screen, I think. So in order to do that, we essentially have to work backwards from the current line, calculating the lengths of lines, until we have counted about half the screen height. So this is going to involve some fairly creative use of compute length. Okay. Uh, while first line is not equal. 
equal to the start and total height is less than height over two. Now we know we know that first line is above the gap, so this makes things really straightforward. The first line is pointing at the character after a new line. So uh, while the slide is not equal to buffer to start and uh, back up so we're pointing at the new line. So this will then back up to the new line and then back up to the uh, pre-decrement. Do you want a pre-decrement? And then keep going back until the previous, until we're looking at the character after another new line. And we want to mt So line end points at the new line for the current line. We do this and now first line is pointing at the beginning of the previous line and line end is pointing to the end of it. This allows us to do total height equals compute length first line Line end null. So that will calculate the length of the line that we've just walked through and add it to the total height. Once we've done that, we then clear the screen and render from the first line. Okay. Uh, four, five, five qualifier error. Really? Draw line. Uh, returns a const. But current line is not const. Draw line really needs to return the type of the thing that got passed in. Four six seven qualifier error. Yeah, this makes no difference to the actual code. This compiler is uh, doesn't know what to do with const other than just check them. OK, 
Okay, let's go down. One more. Yeah, uh, it's gone into an infinite loop where it's attempting to adjust the um, the scroll position, but it never actually manages it. So I bet compute length here is returning zero. So if this ever gets ported to more sophisticated terminals, we'll need a way to use uh, insert and delete lines to actually make things a bit faster. I'm not going to worry about that now. So. That's not actually printing any numbers, which means I do not believe it's going through here. Ah, right. Yeah, first line was current line. Just trying to move the... Because current, yeah, okay. Because first line is actually at the top of the screen at this point. So you can't scroll up any further. But we keep insisting as it try to scroll... So, hence the infinite loop. Uh, also, I'm aware that problems will probably occur if you have lines longer than one screen full. And down. Yep, that seemed to work. Ah, it's a bit slow. What's it doing? Well, apart from computing the lengths of lines. But yes, we are successfully scrolling. My debug numbers aren't helping, but that's dreadful. Why? Well, I suppose we are counting. We are go we are going through the strings twice. Once to move the cursor, and once to calculate the length. Okay, I'm going to just. Chop those out and hope that makes a difference. By placing the scroll position in the middle of the screen, it means we can use the same routine in both directions. Okay, that's way faster. Uh, the problem is obviously the debug tracing. Good. That's reasonably nippy. Be nice if there was a way to flush the keyboard buffer after a render. Actually, there is. Uh. It's not very good. Okay, um, why are we not getting the EOF at the bottom of this? Anyway, can we insert some text? Now we get an EOF. Stupid emulator K-Pro keyboard.
yeah, we're really going to have to do something about that. It's Judging by the flickering, it's ray drawing these two lines and this line and probably this line as well. So that's a bug there. Let's go up here a bit. Let's try and trim text here. That is just plainly not good enough. But the scrolling does actually seem to work. Awesome. Uh, so, EOF. Okay, so, yeah, why did we get an EOF at the end of that line? Because that should not be possible. No, that is, in fact, perfectly possible. Um, so, in fact... We want to do, we only want to draw the EOF marker uh, if we're at the beginning of a line. Other than, otherwise we just treat it like a new line. Because like the character at buffer end is a new line. So can I do 30 down and have it work? Yes, I can. So here is our end of file. So if I insert some text. Okay. Yeah, it's not really happy doing that. So this is just edge conditions. I'm inserting text before the last end of file character, which means, of course, that uh, now there is text before it, then we don't draw it because, like, we're not at the beginning of a line. But we haven't drawn the line below because we don't need to even though a new line has just turned up because we're inserting text before the end of file marker. So that's, to be honest, not too hot. We could probably apply rules to make that work better, but I think it would be easier not to. This is going to display the, the bottom of the file in a slightly different style, which I think will be easier to work with. So, 40 down. 
and here is our end of file thing. So I can insert some text. So it's actually behaving exactly the way it did before. But due to the different style of rendering, uh, it looks better. So 100 down. I need to find some different stock text. I've typed that one a lot. Okay, that's actually working. Good. Um, I just want to Um, and recompute screen position here is going to do the scrolling if necessary. So we should get inserting long lines of text for free. We should get scrolling when inserting long amount of text for free. So this is working because this line fits in these two lines. So hopefully, as soon as we... Yep, that worked. Awesome! It has reset the status line. Uh, do I want to change... Let's try using go to zero zero for that. We do want that one to be clear. We do want that one to be clear. Yeah. And we're still above fifty K free space. That's great. Is that, how does that look? Um, is that better than clearing the screen? I think it looks nicer. It's more obvious what's happening. Just generally a bit smoother. I mean, it's also going to be very slightly faster if you're using a real terminal. If you're not using a real terminal, then clearing the screen is like completely quick. Okay, that looks good. Right. Commit. We need a few more commands. In particular, we need uh, X, which is which I use all the time. Like everyone has their own favorite set of 
uh, VI commands. Nobody uses the same set of VI commands. So, if Uh, if we if we have reached the end of the line, stop. Otherwise, delete the character to the right of the cursor. Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, um, you want to redraw the current line. Um, this is common code. So we can do redraw current line. So what, where are we doing this? Well, we can Do that? No, it doesn't. So X. Yep. That works just fine. Let's delete several at once. 10x, 20x, yep, good. Uh, DD, now, D, capital D it takes a motion as a parameter. And we can actually support several. The one I use is uh, sorry, that's lowercase d. So this is a two key sequence. And you can use all kinds of different motions if you want. The common ones are w for word and another d for line. So So we read in a character, then we do the work. Now, if it's a now, if it's a word, what does this do? D W. 
it deletes up until the next word boundary. So, uh, we wish to uh, while gap end is not buffer end. Um, so essentially we want to delete characters until word boundary here is correct. So if Okay, delete. Uh, yeah, if. Okay, yes, we will. To get to the character on the left, if we're at the beginning of the buffer, then let's call it a. Uh, we assume that we're on a word, so let's just do that. Otherwise, it's the character to the left of the gap. So, while gap start is, while gap end is not buffer end, Uh, we always want to delete one character, so uh, we always want to delete one character, but we have to put the check there. Yeah, okay, yeah. to delete up until the end of the buffer but we also want to look at the character there. I'm trying to avoid having two two of these comparisons you see because that's like nasty. Yeah I don't think I can't. I don't think I can. So if gap end is not buffer end. Uh, if gap end is buffer end. Right. Otherwise, fetch the uh, I don't have auto completion set up on this vim, but I do elsewhere. Word boundary is called. So if word boundary left, comma gap end then stop. So what have we got here?
So if there's white space at the beginning of the the line or the buffer, then actually, yeah, if we're at the beginning of the line, gap start here will be a new line. So for consistency, let's make this a new line as well. Right. But this hasn't worked. Why hasn't it worked? I think it could well have worked, it's just we didn't see the result because we forgot to redraw the current line. Okay. Delete word. Well, it deleted. It didn't delete what I wanted, but it deleted. And something is confused because I can't go down. So let's try redraw. Okay, yeah, that's actually deleted quite a lot. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, We want to stop when we hit a new line. Ah, caps lock. So we're not going to allow the user to word delete off the end of a line. can move by words. So move to the middle of title, delete word. Okay, that's doing, that's more or less right. It is deleting words. However, oh no, that's correct. It is deleting the space following. Good, that's now working. We have delete word. Uh, delete line is a little more challenging not that much more challenging actually uh, so we want to go to the beginning of the line Actually, I'm going to do this one out of line for reasons. So all this is going to be is well, okay, and
I think that's right. So you see this then allows us to just do cursor home, redraw current line. Uh, sorry, cursor home, delete rest of line. The reason why we want to do this is because this also allows us to do Now we don't actually want to do redraw current line in this for this reason. So actually we're going to cheat. That is, if we call with a count of zero, then this means that uh, then it's been called internally from somewhere else. So we should be able to go into the L of title and do delete dollar. No problem. Uh, we go down to this long line and we do D D. Is that right? Does that leave an empty line? Okay, that's actually left an empty line. We don't want that. Uh, let's just do a control L to make sure. Yep, it has done the right thing. Well, the wrong thing, but yeah. So this is actually, so what this has done is it's cleared the line. So we now need an extra condition, which is if we're not at the end of the buffer, then delete the new line following. We know there's a new line because this has left it there. So delete the version line, dd. Uh, what did that do? I don't think that redrew correctly. dd. Yeah, that hasn't redrawn correctly. So I have to do a control L and it has actually worked, but why has that not worked? Shouldn't this figure it out automatically? We are the reason why it hasn't worked is current line Y hasn't changed and the mm, caps lock. But we need to flush the display height to force it to recalculate it. And in fact, this is going to apply here as well. So we can actually do Wait a minute, wait a minute. Redraw current line is supposed to actually... Yes, it draws the... Yeah, that's rubbish. Uh, that's actually supposed to work. 
Ah, I know what's happening. Yeah. Uh, so the current line is being uh, cleared. Yeah, we don't need this after all. The This clears the line. This removes the next line, but the line after is the same height as the line we just cleared. So it doesn't think anything's changed. So we do actually need to do this. So we should be able to go down to version dd, done, good. Let's just make sure the first line works without doing anything bad, yep. Let's go down to the bottom of the file. Can I delete this line that doesn't have anything in it? Nope, what about this one? Good, that works just fine. Excellent. So we have some deletion work working, that's good. Uh, we do need to make go to line work. And this is pretty straightforward. Uh, we go to the beginning of the uh, the, the document, and then we just count new lines. So, so while um, Line number is actually one based, so we don't want to check. Yeah, okay, while. Line number is one based, so we do pre decrement. screen position for free? Yes, we do. So all I need to do is that. Let's let this go. So there's actually a problem. It's not going to be quite like VI. In real VI, if you do Shift G with no count, it goes to the bottom of the file. You need one G to go to the top. But that's kind of not how our one is working. Anyway. Five, go. Uh, no. Oh, no, we are there. It just didn't do anything. 30, go. Anyone? OK, 
Okay, that hasn't done what I wanted to. So what this is supposed to do is to... Oh, we didn't set current line. Okay, so current line equals cap start. It doesn't, didn't know anything had changed. So I think there is, once this works, there is one more command I need. Uh, that was kind of weird. Go. Okay. Five go. That's not line five. Four go. Seven go. Oh, uh, this is actually, this is not working at all. What it's doing is it's very, very slowly scanning to the end of the document. So this quite slowly scans the beginning of the document. So keep copying lines. Yeah, this should work. Okay, go to line zero is in fact jumping to the end of the document. So we want go to line one to go to the beginning of the document. Because after we've done insert file, we're looking at the end. Okay, so if we do one go, does it go to the top? Yes. Two go. Long pause. End of the document. Hmm, yeah, I'm not so enamored with that. Um, Ah, yes, by decrementing line number here and also decrementing here, we were uh, subtracting two each time round. And yeah, that wasn't working. Ah, right. Okay, let's go to 10, go. Not bad, 50, go. End of the file, one, go. 30, go. Okay, I don't need that status line after all, which is nice. Uh, 
I want... Yeah. The default count... So VI distinguishes between not having a count and having a default count of one. So we could do this, but it would involve... Uh, we'd have to pass in zero to all the commands, and then the commands would have to... like Each one would have to set its own default. Unless... We could specify the default in a structure. This now becomes struct command editor cb equals So go to line here is a default of zero. conversion of int to pointer. Does it not like the... Ah, uh, that's because this is an array. In fact, I don't want that anymore. So there is one, uh, we need one command for doing editing. We need a few colon commands to allow us to save files, which is kind of important in an editor. But there is one command that uh, I just used quite a lot, which reminded me of it. Okay, shift G. Okay, that was a bit slow. Also, that's the wrong one. This is going to be tax. Uh, there's one command which kind of defines vi, really, which is dot. Dot repeats the last thing you did. And it is amazingly useful. However, I am not really sure I can implement that in a reasonable fashion. Shift G. Uh, 
I know why this is slow. It's hitting the end of the buffer and then it's just spinning on that loop while a counter goes from max, uh, uint max to zero. And that'll be why counting zero failed as well. So for dot, you have to store what you did, and it's only some commands are stored. Shift G. Brilliant. And it's not just a matter, like motion commands are not stored. Uh, things like X are stored, counts are stored. But the real problematic one is insertions are stored. So I should now be able to press dot and have that thing be inserted. It is amazingly useful, but also kind of problematic. Um, So I would like to implement that, but I'm not going to do it now because it's going to be a complete rabbit hole. Anyway, command I would need to implement is J, which is join delete multi. Join is the only blessed way to delete new lines between lines. So we kind of need it. And it is relatively straightforward. What we do is we do not move the cursor. Let me just double check that. Yep. We do not move the cursor. We shunt a pointer off to the end of the line. Oh yeah, and you notice when I do uh, let me just, so if I press Shift J here, there's a space. So that's really straightforward. Uh, we, we want to work right. until we hit a new line. Then we turn that new line into a space. And we redraw. Shift J. No problem. Just works. It's a really good way to make hideously long lines, which take a long time to render. So let's actually just try making a line longer than the screen and seeing what happens. I mean, it is pretty tough given that how long it's taking to redraw this. What am I doing? We have counts. 10, J. 10, J. Oh, <laughs> we have in fact reached the end of the line, or uh, the end of the document. So, oh, oh command I forgot. Uh, o and Shift O. I was just about to do that. Okay, uh, let's insert. 
go up. Yeah, I can't be bothered to type that much. So I need to type like 240 characters. But join works, so let's actually put in uh, O for open below. which is um, cursor down one, cursor home one, um, We are now looking at the character after a new line. So we wish to uh, insert a new line. That's after the next one. Uh, how do I force this to redraw from here? Oh, the current line has changed length, so... Hmm... Have I just discovered a problem with this code? I think I have. Well, anyway, uh, the current line has changed length, therefore I need to uh, nerf the display height cache. Uh, redraw it and insert the text. I have a bit of a suspicion that with very large lines, uh, once they get bigger than the screen, then it will go into an infinite loop of redrawing as it tries to adjust the scroll position. And that would be bad. So, yeah, we're under 50k. So, Shift O for open. Didn't do what I wanted there. I may need slightly more intelligent redrawing. I mean, it's done the right thing, but I was kind of hoping that that wouldn't trigger the redraw. I think I may need some way to batch redraws together but given that redrawing repopulates the line height, I'm not sure it would be safe. So.
Yeah, uh, okay. Let's have a simple dirty flag, I think. So the idea is that whenever we call BIOSCON in, we call this instead. So I can remember what I called it, get char and redraw. And instead of calling redraw current line, we do screen is dirty equals true. So that here, so let's these do not actually update the uh. don't need this anymore and all these things we don't need this anymore let me just say actually that's just usual current Okay, let's see if that actually made a difference. Oh yeah, and also, does it? What's it do for the the size? Bigger? No. It seems to be that did not redraw. It did the work, but it didn't redraw. Okay, let's try open. It redraws twice. Why does it still redraw twice? Where is open gone? So, uh, insert text. What does insert text do? It just calls get jar and redraw. So it should not actually, it should do the redraw at this point. Uh, 
unless recompute screen position is triggering a screen render. But I don't think it can. Interesting. Anyway, where's my join gone? So that is setting screen is dirty to be true. So you see, I would then, it should come back here to recompute screen, ah. Draw and get char. Get char and redraw. Yep. Uh, So that, oh yeah, well, are we using old current line for anything anymore? Old current line. No, let's lose it. Right. I'm actually amazed this is working as well as it is without proper screen refreshing. Okay, let's go down to here and we do a join. That didn't work. That did work because the current line changed height. Okay, let's try open. Hmm. Hmm. So this is also this is actually adding a new line below the um current one. Oh, ah, this is going to bite me uh, because we've moved stuff around, but we haven't called recalculate position. Therefore, current line Y is not correct. So that's not actually doing what I wanted at all. But uh, recalculate position, or uh, recompute screen position may cause a scroll which causes a screen render so we want to avoid calling recompute screen position where possible So this is actually doing the same logic that I need, which is it physically redraws the current line. Yep. 
Yeah. This causes current line Y to be computed correctly. But it comes from screen Y here. So... I think what I actually need here is to Yeah, we haven't So current line y current line y is currently set from the the line that we were at before we went down. So do we want to get rid of the screen dirty stuff? Is that just not going to work? Uh, or can we do... more interesting things? What are we using current line Y for? from here on. Uh, this thing in insert text. This thing in delete line. And open blow. So I think what I'm actually going to do is Let's give that a try. Uh, three, four, two. So the reason for the plus plus in the um, in open below is because we've moved the cursor down one and we don't want to nuke the cache for the uh, this line which is un unrelated to what we're actually doing so open below bingo This emulated keyboard is not much fun to type on, to be honest. Uh, it does seem to be working. Good. Oh yeah, I also wanted to check join. Uh, 
actually. Save a little bit of space that way. So we want to join these. Good, that's working. Perhaps she speed things. Uh, what's that doing? Is that in an infinite loop? I just went down a few lines. Why would that be? Yeah, that's in an infinite loop. Um, I think it is trying to adjust the scroll position, but why would it be doing that? Let's try that again. We are in lowercase. go down. Okay, I think it the line I think the length of this line is wrong. And it thinks it's off possibly off the bottom of the screen. So this merges the lines equals line height changed. which nukes the cached height of the current line and all lines below, and it calls screen is dirty. Screen is dirty causes redraw current line. Redraw current line tries to draw the current line. Which should be fine. This will fire and it will cause the screen to be rendered. We then recalculate the screen position, which may cause uh, I think that it may be calling recompute screen position with stale cache data. I think that dirty stuff is more trouble than it's worth. Um. 
Hmm. So that did hit this. Okay, I need a short break and I will think about this. Okay, I'm gonna lose all that screen dirty stuff thanks to the magic of copious undo because it's just overcomplicated and to be honest, I'm getting quite tired. And I don't think I'm up to the complex logic. So let's just keep getting rid of stuff until This the I think that was here. Do we have okay? So the problem was that uh, these weren't behaving quite right. Yeah, so we've take, taken the logic for home for open down, so it is actually moving the cursor to the right place. But let's try join. Yeah, and that's got the same problem we had before. So we want a different solution to this. It is... The problem is that redrawing current line is not good enough if the... because there's the line below that is changing height. So the obvious thing to do here is to somehow force it to redraw from here down, like it's joined, we know we're going to have to, which we can actually do very easily because we've got the code uh, Because we can just do this. And go to current line Y. And render. Ah, what was it called? Render screen. Render screen. like this, that does forces a redraw. So open below is actually going to happen in a very similar way. So cursor down, cursor home. We know there's space because we do this, so we insert the carriage return. Let's insert text gone. We go to uh, current line Y is not set, so we actually need to redraw the current line. Does that set? Yeah, that recomputes the screen position, which does it. Uh, but in fact, we 
we just want to recompute the screen position because this sets cursor the current line y and then we can do this and then we drop into insert text count con go to unknown control really is that an error Line one? Oh, <laughs> don't know how that happened. So, start the editor up. Join. Good, that's working. And we go down and bad things happen. So the bug we were hitting before was not actually caused by the dirty stuff. It was, it was there already. Well, if we can actually avoid the multiple redraws, then not having the dirty stuff will make things generally faster and smaller. I can already see a few places where I can shave bytes. So let's try O. Yep, that worked. It didn't put the cursor in the right place, but that worked. So after we've rendered the screen, we need to recompute the screen position again. Yeah, I think we need to... I suspect this is all we need. Let's try that. I can see this number slowly going down. I mean, it's pretty good for a CPM text editor, but I kind of want it as big as possible. Okay, that's true. Okay, right, that's failed again. So it's moving down from this line. That triggers whatever's going on. So I think the line height is just completely bogus. Where are we setting the line? The display height, rather. Here. Here. Here, here. So what is going on? Well, I can actually... Uh, the screen. P draw line. And let's do some hairy debugging.
So what this should do is overwrite at the beginning of each line with the, the height that the system thinks it is. That number rendering code is very, very slow. That's like, I didn't write that, that's in the standard library. I think I need to do a, a optimization pass there. Okay, so so three, three, four, So let's just try going down from here. Yeah, that. So what doesn't it like about it? This is correct. This is the right number. One, two, three, four. Current line Y is greater than... Is current line Y completely out of bounds? It shouldn't be. Like this. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, is that right? So there's a two line, I noticed in my test document there's a two line high line right at the bottom of the first screen. So if it's, this is not actually matching, then it will continue to loop, which means it will be picking up garbage as current line y is greater than height. So I think that is what we need to do. Yeah, they didn't make val grind for CPM. Yep, that, and I think that is better. Nope. Nope, that died. Height, can put I current line Y, can put S, can put I display height current line Y. down. That's interesting. It's not printing anything. Um, I know why it's not printing anything, which is the bounds check. So I actually need to stick this in the status line. Gah. Uh, what a mess. This is just debugging code, so 
let's stick that line height minus one. That will work fine. I want to put it at the bottom of the screen because as it redraws the top of the screen, it will give me time to see what the numbers are. Twenty-three zero. So it's hitting the boundary because Uh, it's it's trying to scroll because it thinks the current line is on line 23. Why? It seems to happen when that joined line grows from three lines to four lines. I think I know what's going on. So this is using line length to skip between lines. And I think join here is changing the length of this line. We don't need to recompute the screen position because the current line is not moving. We do need to render the screen from here down. And rendering the screen will um, called draw line for each line, which will cause the display height and line length to be updated. Then recompute screen position here will fire and place the cursor in the right place. But well, the cursor won't move, because join doesn't do that. I think the problem was that by calling recompute screen position before calling render, it was picking up the three line long uh, length and then going and looking at the wrong line for the rest of the length. So four lines. Nope, still doing it.
this. Mm. This will be something really, some really subtle and really simple. I hate this kind of debugging. Yeah, what's happened is this design has grown organically. So the only thing we're actually using the line length for is to determine where the current line is here. So that was interesting. Uh, when so I did have a four line long line, which worked fine. Does it need to be this line here? So I mostly test it the same way. So I usually start box 579 here because I can just do three joins and then it's three joins down. Okay. So maybe that's not quite right. So let's try three joins from here. This gives me my four lines. So that scrolled once. It put this line in the middle of the screen. So it... It thought we needed to scroll down. And it keeps trying to scroll down. Okay, let's do this. This will again annotate the lines with the heights. And what's more, it will also only annotate the lines it's actually visiting. So I think it's pulling garbage out of somewhere and it's going off into the middle of nowhere. Oops, didn't want to go. So go to this one only, so three, join. And we're here, we go down one. Right, uh, what's happening is, 
I do know what's happening. I don't know why, but I do know what's happening. Uh, it, it starts at the top and it iterates down until we reach the line which is marked as the current line. It does this by comparing the pointer at the beginning of the line. And if the lengths don't quite match up, it will skip over that pointer and not match it. So it will always head off down to the bottom of the page and think that uh, you scrolled down. So I believe that in P is not I believe that the line lengths are not being set correctly. So let's Man, this is like the the second last major feature. Okay, so these are showing the lengths in decimal. Go down one. Yeah, you see that's not two characters long. So that's actually, yeah, that's just not right. That will be because we joined the Um, actually, that may. So, this is the line length pulled out of the cache. So, let's go up here and. Uh, Okay, eight go, three J. Right, this is not two characters long. Why did it think it was two characters long? Oh, I am a, such an idiot. I am such an idiot. Am I an idiot? I am such an idiot. Line length longer than 256 characters. How long did that take? Oh, yeah. So it's doing all the math properly, but the number is rolling over. Awesome. So, eight, go. 3J, 258 characters, which happens to be 256 plus 2. And we go down, and it works. Right, let's take out that debug code. Okay, uh, while we're at it, let's do the, the last of our main command, which is open above. And uh, let's actually put that one here. Open below, open above. So this is extremely similar to open below, 
but different. Instead of going down one and homing, we just home. I think that's even it. Uh, in fact, we can probably load. So they're not quite the same. So that if you're on the last line of the file, uh, you can't go down because there isn't anywhere to go. However, with our model, you can put the cursor on the empty last line. So the only thing you can do is open above, so that will actually work fine. Let's give this a try. So open above. Awesome. That works. Open below. Awesome. That works. Join. That works. Okay, uh, let's just see what we actually changed. Uh, a few more commands. Yeah, after all that, very little other than a bit of white space actually ended up changing in the code. Right. Uh, now, I'm trying to remember, there's a there's a Q command to save. Um. So there's normally the these various commands, but okay. Um, I thought there was a single letter command for save and quit as well as ZZ. Right. Uh... This is another multi-character thing like uh, like delete, except with a rather smaller set of commands. And of course, you, there's no point using uh, counts. So in fact, the only thing we can do is um, we don't keep track of whether our document's dirty. So which of these commands will actually make the document dirty? So insert will. This calls insert, so this one will not. Delete write will. Actually, you can do this in much Clean away. I'm just trying to think of whether how um, 
I'm trying to think of how big the various sizes will be. Now let's just set it in flags. It's 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 easier. So uh, up, word right, insert text. Delete right. Delete rest of line. Delete multi. Oh, this one called delete rest of line, so that's fine. Join will. Open above calls insert. Open below calls insert. So. So Z, Z saves and quits. If the document is dirty, save the file to the current file name. Um, if there is no current file name, then we want to not exit. So we're actually going to need save file to be a little bit intelligent. So if we are not dirty or save file succeeds, then quit. Otherwise do nothing. What was the other one? Uh, ZQ, quit without checking for changes. Quit. And the other commands do nothing. So we need a We need a quit function. Uh, actually, this is So all this is going to do is clear the console and exit. Where is our insert file? Okay, this is, this really belongs as a command because we can insert arbitrary text into our document at any point. But we're going to put it up here in lifecycle because we're actually next to it. We are going to have save file. to the specified file name. Uh, 
and it's stupid. Uh, So the important thing to bear in mind is that that buffer is actually shared with the command line arguments. So as soon as we touch the buffer, we lose access to our command line arguments, which is a shame. Anyway, uh, name sets status message. So we're actually going to want to check to see if the file name is there, but for now we're going to do out.text and this returns a success code. And we're going to call say that it succeeds. We're actually going to have to copy the file name into storage somewhere. So, said. That's it. Did I remember to wire that up? I did not. If I do Z, it says save document has not changed. Let's insert some stuff. Now we do Z, document has changed. Uh, Z again. And we exit. That new line didn't quite do what I expected it to. Ah, I only ever use new line in one place. Well, let's lose this then. It was wrong anyway. We need the carriage return and line feed to make this work. Um, in fact... We are going to use... Uh, what's it called? CPM does have a built-in function to print strings. Print string, that's what I called it. Although it predates C. So the strings are terminated with a dollar sign, not with a null. That will, of course, like put a dollar sign and a null on, so we waste a byte.
So Z Z. Oh, I forgot to clear the screen. Which is one four. Okay. So saving the file. Uh, now this. So here we what we did was we. Um, read and translated the file into the internal representation. Now we need to do the opposite. So, open file name. Oh, trunk to truncate it. I think that's right. I'm just trying to remember which, how much of the um, uh, how much of the flags I actually I actually emulated. So if we get an error, fail because we, you know, don't want to throw away the document. Right, now what we're going to do is we're going to copy bytes from the buffer into the temp uh, copy bytes from the document into the temporary buffer while doing any of the necessary translation and then we flush blocks out to disk. Now this is a little bit more interesting than reading when we so the when we read we read fixed blocks and then they turn into variable size blocks in the buffer in the other direction we have to write fixed size blocks we have to keep filling the buffer and then flushing it to disk when it's full So, that'd be the input pointer, the output pointer, input pointer starts here, output pointer starts at again, default DMA. while I want to keep going until we reach the end we also okay so while the input pointer is not at the end and Output pointer or the output pointer is pointing at the beginning of the buffer. So what we're saying is uh, keep going until we have read all the bytes out of the document and there are no bytes left in the buffer that need flushing. So read a byte. If there is a byte to read in the in the document, then read it. Otherwise, it's an end of file character. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep filling the buffer. When we reach the end of the document, we then fill the rest with end of files. Now we also need to do carriage return line feed translation.
So we actually want so. If there is a character pushed, use it. Otherwise, if we want to read a character, do so. Otherwise, it's an end of file character. Okay, write that. Not yet, not yet. If what we read was a new line, then make sure that the thing we write next is a new line. But instead, write a carriage return. Now, we write our byte. If the output buffer, if the output pointer ends up at the end of the buffer, then write a block to disk. If it if that fails give up and reset the pointer back to the beginning of the buffer. So we keep going while we haven't reached the end of the buffer. And while uh, well, we haven't reached the end of the document, and while we haven't reached the end of the buffer, and while nothing left is remaining to be pushed. Okay. Uh, oh yes. And once we finished, we close the file descriptor. We are no longer dirty. Close the file script to room turn success. Meanwhile, on error, close the file script to room turn false. Okay, let's see what this does. Fails to compile. I don't mind telling you that this has taken a lot longer than I thought it would. The huge false start near the beginning really didn't help and debugging the uint8 issue was also not helpful but there's a lot more th more to one of these editors than meets the eye and i underestimated how long it would take so let's save our document save writing i don't hear floppy disk noises anymore because my amplifier amplifiers shut down I mean that's slow. Yeah, that's not good. Also, there is no way that our file is big enough to seek through all these tracks. 
It's got itself into an infinite loop and it's just writing garbage. Yeah. That's not working. Why did that not work? Uh, well, this won't help. Um, we forgot about the gap. Try that. It'd be nice if hmm, easy ways to make this faster. It turns out I am actually failing to compile with optimization on, but the bad news is the optimization with the ACK is pretty bad. Okay, so some text, save. Yep, that's failed again. This global optimization flag should be uh, six. Let's just see if that makes a difference. Let's see if to those QE, QE. Really, 10k? That's depressing. Yeah, maybe 200 bytes. Yeah, optimization in the ACK is not worth much, but it sh should be the, should be on anyway. So why is this failing? Each time through the loop, we read up to one byte from the input buffer. We always write one byte to the output buffer, like always. So every 128 passes through the loop, we are ready to write a block. So. Yes, we, if we're going to use the buffer to debugging information, then we do kind of need to do it after we finished writing our block of data. Uh, 
So this will actually write the the output pointer. Uh, yeah, this this document is really small. It's less than a track, so. The pointer is not advancing. So that suggests that we have reached the end of the buffer. just writing 26s. Um, I can actually see what we uh, I can actually see what we actually wrote. Uh, this down here is garbage because um, The KPro file system is a bit weird, and uh, the CPM tools doesn't quite understand it. But it hasn't updated. Like I killed it before we could update the directory, so all we get is the first sector. But what is in our uh, file? Zeros. Okay, that hasn't hasn't actually done anything useful. So is it actually writing out in the file bytes indefinitely? I think it could well be. So it's never actually meeting the exit criteria of this loop. So if we're not at the end of the buffer, then read one byte from the buffer. Otherwise return 26. That seems unambiguous. And in P is not modified anywhere else. We skip over the gap here. thing I can call this finished or at least good enough
So, so some text, save. Five nine one two four. It seems to be very bogus for the pointer. That's like right at the top of memory. That looks like buffer end actually. But we never see a block for buffer start. So let's try putting this here. Oh, and we actually need, there is one more thing we need to do, which is like loading and saving named files. Okay, so here's the point where it skips over the gap. And then it keeps working through the gap to the document. And we reach 59124 and it stops. It doesn't advance any further. I'm willing to bet that it's hit this new line. Right, right. This is because, yeah, yeah. So it pushes the new line character. It, it pushes the new line character and it writes the carriage return. And then it would go around the loop again and it pulls the new line out of here. And yeah, yeah, I am getting tired. Okay. Uh, that did not clear the screen. It's the wrong character. Uh, sorry, I'm thinking of the BBC Micro, which uses 12 as the clear screen. I actually want 0032. So we can now save files and load files. We need to keep track of the current file name, which we do in a buffer. And the trying to remember what the there should be a uh, there should be a constant with the file name length in it, but I don't think it's set. So sixteen is enough space for. Uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and one's left to spare. Okay. If. Uh, if we have too many arguments. Let's print a simple error message and stop.
if there is one, uh, if there are two arguments, then the file name gets copied to argv1. And If the file name is too long, then just um, truncate it. Otherwise, zero length file name. So down here, when we insert the file, go if. There's a um, if there's a file name, load it. Otherwise, it's just like new file. Do you know this? I won't mod I won't change the status line because it has our bytes free thing in it. All right, and I don't want this anymore. So, if, if we're not dirty, just quit. If there is no file name, then we cannot save the file. Otherwise, Attempt to save the file, and if it works, quit. Okay, why did that trap? That means uh, the libc had a runtime error. CPM exit should be, ah, ah. Yep. Uh, in fact, it didn't trap. What it did was it printed some garbage from the string table. Okay, that bit works. Let's make me a little go on. Um, Load a file. Exit. Yep. Let's delete lots of stuff. Save. Okay, we have a file. What does it look like? What do the raw bytes look like? Yep, that looks good. Two carriage returns followed by uh, I should probably ch let me just check to that's got two new lines at the end. Whoops, QCSPASM. So we change. I haven't implemented replace. I just tried to do replace and it didn't work. 
Okay. So let's replace that character with a J. Save. So I'm going to count the new lines at the end to see if they are if they match. Are we inserting or removing terminating new lines? Uh, we've lost a new line, but the the thing I did may have done that. Uh, I'm not going to think about it. It's that's good enough. Uh, but if we start a new file. We have no way to save it. Uh, what did that just do? Ah, right, it actually saved a blank file. That wasn't what I wanted. Yep, okay. We do need a way to actually set the file name, and we're actually going to do that using colon commands. So we actually have to implement some colon commands. And I'm actually going to put in another section for those. So this is going to be really irritating. Set the status line to nothing. We that can be made smaller. We then go to the status line. And then we start a really old fashioned command line. And we're actually going to do this with uh, Uh, CPM has a read line. I seem to have not set a um, it actually takes a structure but I appear not to have defined anything for it. So this will read the user's input into the buffer. Uh, buffer 1 contains the length of the output. So if 
Oh yeah, but it doesn't print a new line at the end. So if buffer one is zero, then this means you to just press return. So break. And then we do a complete redraw. wire it up I don't I did not remember to wire it up colon there we go colon prompt press return redraws the screen good So to actually parse the thing, we want to use store talk break string to see zero or more non-empty tokens. The string to be parsed should be specified in store. Each call to store talk turn to point it to a null terminated string. Oh yeah, we also, we need to zero terminate the buffer. Um, yeah, that's weird. Buffer one contains the length of the result and the first two bytes are consumed. Example of actual stir talk. Oh yeah, okay. So we do it once and that gives us the first word. So we go If the if the first command starts with W, then we want to write. This is going to be dodgy as hell because I want to go to bed. So we then pull the second word off out of the buffer. Uh, this just do a quick syntax check of it. Otherwise, we populate the file name with the word that we just read. Uh, 
and then we try to save it. Okay, let's give that a try. Uh, eight to six incompatible pointers in. Uh, so. Colon right. No, no file name. Right. Foo. Uh, let's actually put the. Yeah. So we actually want to put go to status line here. Uh, I think that wrote. Anyway, okay, there's no status message there, but let's try writing a file. Okay, that seemed to work. I can't quit yet. Said Q. And we have a hello.txt. Yep, that worked. If the save was, if the save was successful, uh, this should actually write the current file name. So, if there was an argument, then just populate the file name. Okay. And this marks the document as dirty. So, if we if we save successfully, if the user asks to quit, quit. If the user just asks to quit, if we are not dirty, quit. Otherwise, produce a message. Uh, if we are not dirty or really quit okay assuming this works that's it for now it is late I want to go to bed I need to get up early to go hiking so can we save with ZZ? 
I need to do something about that, I think. Uh, can we quit? No, we can't. Can we... Can we write? Um, that wrote to the empty file, but let's... Now we can quit. Yeah, okay. Reason why um, ZZ wasn't working is this set status line here. So we actually want to do C BIOS come in. And in fact, uh, D will suffer from the same issue. So let's just change that. Uh, let's actually use the full CCP. This time. Which is a whole uh, CCP dot asm, not CPP. Twenty six K. That's fine, we can load that. So I can hear the track noises. And this is actually loading quite briskly. Okay, here we have our document. 100 lines down. 200 lines down. How about we just go to the end? Long pause. We're at the end. Oh, and it doesn't have a line terminator character. So that probably didn't help. Let's see, can we remove those that junk? Yes, we can. And we can still move around reasonably briskly. Good. Yeah, that's, that's not a valid... Uh, Yeah, let's just search some random text. And save and exit. Yeah, saving is a lot slower than loading. I'm going to have to have a look at that piece of code. But not tonight. Awesome. All right, I believe this is now a functioning editor. And to prove it, I'm going to check it in. This is now a functioning editor. Push. They're no going back now. Okay, well, 
I have no idea how many hours this was, but it's quite a lot of them. Um, if anybody is still watching and found this interesting, please let me know in the comments. And now I'm going to bed.